Welcome, everybody, um, to The Hold here in Ipswich. Um, to those of you um, actually here in the room, um, it's very good to see you. And to those of you online, um, it's great to have you involved in this conference from, um, from wherever you're sitting at the moment. Um, this is the closing conference of um, Fresh Four Seas, um, a project that's been made possible through the funding from um, the EU Interreg Two Seas programme. I'm Matt Hollis, I'm Head of Environment Strategy at Suffolk County Council, one of the UK partners in the project, um, and I'm going to be guiding you through today and facilitating some of the questions and answers that I'm sure you'll have um, about the work that we've been doing. We'll be exploring um, six, um, the six demonstration projects that have been um, included in the, uh, in the project, guided by the partners that have delivered them. So, um, you'll have the opportunity to hear exactly how they've done it, um, what the issues that um, they've faced and um, the problems that they've, they've overcome and be able to ask them questions and find out more to, so um, you have the opportunity to learn from them. Um, we're also um, going to be able to welcome two guest speakers, one this morning, one this afternoon, to get in, um, really um, vital outside perspectives into the issues that we've been examining um, throughout the project. Um, we'll conclude by um, looking at some of our stakeholder engagement and what we've learned from, um, from what we've done and what others have learned from what we've done. And, um, and finally, we'll have a roundtable discussion where we'll be able to, um, to maybe poke around in some of the detail a bit more um, and um, for you to be able to uh, get involved in answer, asking some of the, uh, the, the, the partners some more detailed questions. Um, how are we going to do it? We've got a lot of people online, um, we've got a number of people in the audience here today, um, and so we want you to be involved, we want you to ask questions, um, and we're doing that through, um, through Slido. Um, so hopefully you've seen, because it's on pretty much everything we've produced at the moment, there's a QR code or um, that you can take a picture with your phone and that will take you to the page you need to be at. Or alternatively, you can just go to slido.com um, and put fresh four C's into the, uh, into the search and you will, you will find us. Um, when you get there, you'll see that um, you can view the presentation um, live, um, but there's also a Q&A tab. So press that Q&A tab, it will open up a page and you'll be able to um, put your questions into that. So you can ask a question. If it's if you want to direct a question at a particular um, member of the team, somebody who's presenting, then maybe indicate who that is that you want the question directed at when you, when you ask the question. Um, and you'll be able to see those questions that other people are putting in. Um, and if you um, want a particular question or you recognise the, um, the importance of a particular question and you want that one to, to be asked, you have the opportunity to vote for that. Um, it's fairly straightforward. I think it's a thumbs up icon, you can tick on that and, and um, that will allow us to decide which questions that we have time for to, um, to ask. Um, we will um, select some of those questions and be able to, um, to when the, um, the participants are, are seated down here, we'll be able to select some of those questions and allow you to, um, to ask them. Um, the session's being recorded, so there'll be an opportunity to, uh, to view the recording um, afterwards, um, and also the slides will be um, uh, presented to, um, to, to you um, after the event. Um, finally, if you haven't found them yet, um, the toilets for today, if you're in the room, are um, out of either door and turn left. Um, we're not expecting a fire alarm in the building today, but if um, the alarm does sound, it does mean we need to get out of the building quickly. And the best way to do that is through the rear doors and out the back door of the building to the, um, to the garden area at the back. Um, that's enough from me. I'm now going to hand you over to Bastian, who is our lead partner, um, who's going to give you a quick resume of the project. Good morning. Welcome to the Fresh for Seas final conference. So Fresh for Seas is an Interact to Seas project, which means we got funding from Interact to Seas and we are very grateful for this funding to Interact. And the project is about alternative sustainable fresh water resources for coastal lowlands. The core of the project 
are six demo cases we have, and you will learn much more about the demo cases today during the presentation. So the demo cases are located in the UK, Belgium, and the Netherlands. You can see them on the map. The demo cases have four different types of water users. First of all, agriculture, also industry, nature, and drinking water as a water user. What are the demo cases about? First of all, we have a demo case about recovering water, which is normally drained to sea, but now used for agriculture. This takes place here in Suffolk, very close to Ipswich. Second topic is recovering effluent, which is normally also not reused, but in our project, we have an effluent reuse project in Coxeide, Belgium, and also effluent reuse in Kruiding in the Netherlands. And the third topic we deal with today is recovering water through above ground and especially underground water storage in three demo cases. First of all, again, here in Suffolk. The second case in Braakman Zuid, which is in the Netherlands, very close to Belgium. And the third case is in Belgium in Kwetshagen. I will not tell much about these cases, but uh, you will hear much about it after me in the other talks. The program for today, Matt already briefly told a little bit about it. We start uh, with the keynote by Daniel Johns, after we have, first of all, Richard Trout from the Suffolk County Council, which will say something to welcome you. Then we have three first demo cases of fresh fruit seas in the morning, followed by a lunch. And after the lunch, we come back to have a keynote lecture from Anne Wiersma about managed aquifer recharge uh, as a solution for freshwater scarcity. The second round of demo cases follows then, and please don't leave after the second round because the most interesting part of the program, without any doubt, will be a lecture about stakeholder participation by HZ University, Archeet van Maldegem, and then finally a discussion uh, where you can also ask the questions for, but we have a round table discussion over here at the end. I will leave you with this and I will see you back at the round table discussion. And before the next speaker comes, we have a project video which explains shortly what the project is about. There is a water shortage in our coastal regions and it is increasing due to climate change. Nevertheless, there is a lot of precipitation in winter, but large quantities of precious fresh water are discharged to the sea. That is a huge waste of our most important resource. With the Fresh Four Seas project, we tackle this waste and provide alternative, sustainable water sources in coastal regions. Fresh Four Seas demonstrates three technological solutions. Above ground water storage with smart water management, underground water storage, and treating wastewater with a willow marsh. These solutions are extensively monitored and evaluated. We are also exploring innovative forms of collaboration and business cases to allow the technologies to be adopted more quickly. To this end, we are setting up six demo projects that provide alternative freshwater sources for agriculture, industry, nature and drinking water production. In Suffolk, we are installing a pipeline network that will pump up excess water in winter to store it in storage reservoirs. In summer, the water can then be used for agricultural irrigation. The cooperation between farmers and the public sector partners is of great importance here. At the same location, we are also testing an installation for managed aquifer recharge and recovery. The water surplus from winter is infiltrated into the subsoil, and in periods of dry weather, some of that water can be pumped up again. We keep an extra eye on the water quality in this underground storage. In Belgium, in Coxeide, we focus on a nature-based solution there is already an installation that purifies wastewater to drinking water quality. This installation works through membrane purification. We purify the residual wastewater from those membranes with a willow marsh that largely filters out nutrients and heavy metals. The pruning waste from the willows can be used as biomass or soil improver. In Kvetsache, in Belgium, we store water through both above-ground storage and creek ridge infiltration. This means we raise the groundwater level in sandy soil bodies, so-called creek ridges. This enlarges the freshwater lens in the creek ridge, causing the lens to push the salt water down. At Brakmanzert in the Netherlands, we also apply creek ridge infiltration. But here we first conduct a feasibility and pilot study. 
agriculture and industry cooperate to store excess water from the winter in the underground in order to use it during periods of scarcity. In Kroningen, we work on a combination of above ground water storage and creek ridge infiltration. We are conducting a feasibility study to reuse treated wastewater as irrigation water for local farmers. Water quality is hugely important here as well to meet the regulatory requirements for creek ridge infiltration. Fresh Four Seas is a collaboration between 10 partners from the United Kingdom, the Netherlands and Belgium with support from Interreg Two Seas, co-funded by ERDF. Thank you, Bastian. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Richard Rout to the stage, who's the Deputy Leader and Cabinet Member for Environment and Finance at Suffolk County Council. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, and a, and a very warm welcome to Suffolk, uh, everybody. It's the driest region in the UK, and therefore I think exactly the right place to hold this event today. I'd like particularly to welcome our partners from the Netherlands, Belgium and the UK, guests from a wide range of organisations in the room and indeed watching online. And of course, huge thanks to Interreg to Seas for the funding to, to support this project. We're really pleased to be able to host this conference here in Suffolk, which is the culmination of several years' work that has resulted in six demonstration projects that you've heard about, exploring innovative new ways of storing and treating water, which I'm sure you're, you're looking forward to, to, to digging into later today. As important as the physical infrastructure that has resulted from the, the project is learning um, and cooperating between partners, both at a local and international level, sharing our ideas and solving common problems through collaboration. And this builds our, our collective understanding and is what will enable us to replicate the successes of this project for a much more sustainable future. My role at Suffolk County Council is Deputy Leader and Cabinet. be aware of the, of the breadth of, of issues that the county council deals with and addresses here in Suffolk. It, it ranges from road maintenance, social care for the elderly, disabled and vulnerable adults, waste disposal, the fire service, public transport, thank you very much, public transport, schools, economic development, public health, flood risk, protection of vulnerable children. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but you can appreciate that we have a very strategic view of how society, the economy and the environment interact. And I'm proud of the leadership that we have taken over the last 15 years to prioritise action and leadership in the environmental arena. Our long-standing aspiration for creating the Greenest County was launched back in 2007, and that's been supporting communities and businesses to tackle climate change. We were one of the first county areas in the UK to declare a, carbon emergen uh, a climate emergency and set our, our net zero carbon target of 2030. And we've also made wide ranging commitments to enhance biodiversity here in Suffolk by 30% across our estate by, by 2030. However, one issue that's not included as a direct responsibility of the County Council is water resources. So you may ask, why are we involved in this, pro with this project? Well, as I've said, we live in the, the driest part of the UK. Water is arguably the, the most critical natural resource that underpins all of society and economic activity. We recognise that climate change will continue to impact when, where and how much water will fall as rain. And we understand that growing the economy will require us to identify new sources of water, as well as reserving much more to ensure biodiversity can recover. We're very clear that to meet these targets and rise to these challenges, we, we can't merely rely on water companies to provide supplies in isolation or leave agriculture to find what they need on each individual landholding. We understand that previously siloed groups need to come together to look at big problems together, to take on a much more holistic approach 
in order to find the solutions to these big challenges. This must involve the regulators, universities, landowners, communities, businesses, and indeed public organisations. That's why I'm so pleased to be able to support this project and other similar endeavours. It seems to me that the people involved in this project exemplify the approach required exemplify the approach required to find truly sustainable solutions to our water supply challenge. I'd like to thank them and all of you for the work you're doing and look forward to hearing about more of it today and seeing the replication of the demonstration project starting to appear in the UK, Netherlands and Belgium in the coming years. Finally, I'd just like to thank you all so much for attending. I hope you enjoy what I'm sure will be a very informative and productive day. Without partners like you and the exceptional staff we have here at the County Council and in the wider public sector, this vital work would not be possible and we wouldn't be making the progress that we all need to see. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, moving on now to our first keynote speaker, Daniel Johns from Water Resources East. Um, who's going to talk to us about the, uh, the scarcity, managing the scarcity that we have in, uh, in this region. Daniel. Thank you. Uh, can I check my microphone is working? It sounds like it is. That's perfect. Uh, brilliant. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Matt, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, when you did invite me, I thought, uh, well, first of all, honoured to open, help you open this kind of closing conference of the project, but also since I've been in this role for the last year, I've not heard anything else but, you know, Felix Low Hydro Cycle, all these innovative approaches to capturing the rain that does fall within the driest part of, of, of England. And clear, it's clear with the climate change challenge, with the need to improve river flows and water body health, it's these kinds of approaches that will need to be rolled out at scale uh, in order to us to, to make sure there is the water that both uh, the, the farming industry needs, industry more generally, energy production as well as the public water supply. It's only through these kinds of approaches, together with the larger scale uh, options, that we're going to square the climate change challenge. Um, I should start off by introducing Water Resources East. As I said, I've been in the place for a year. And Water Resources East is an independent, uh, not-for-profit company they were set up originally by the water companies within the east of England because they recognised that it was no longer, uh, it, it no longer made sense to plan for their own water resources independently in silos on a long-term basis. They had to come together collectively to manage the scarce water resources uh, that we all share. And not only that, it has to be a collaboration with the other water-using sectors and other interests uh, other interests with, uh, say, with an interest in managing water, uh, water resources uh, more carefully. So on our board and amongst our funders, it also includes Suffolk Council, Norfolk Council, Essex, as well as the Cambridgeshire Combined Authority, uh, the four water company members with environmental interests, uh, energy interests, and also agriculture as well. So the National Farmers Union and the Association of Drainage Authorities also form part of our board. And we all see ourselves, as Water Resources East, quite an innovative approach to the climate change challenge by bringing people together to work collectively, to look for joint solutions at a kind of you know, major, uh, major scale and the uh, more localised scale uh, to understand and to plot through exactly where our water is going to come from in future years. And beyond that, our membership runs to now more than 180 uh, individual organisations who are formerly members of Water Resources East uh, and take part in our strategic advisory group meetings, our workshops, our events and help shape uh, what I'm going to be presenting to you today which is Water Resources East's first ever long-term water resources plan for the whole of the east of England. We published this back in November. It's still out for consultation. I'll, I'll come to this to, to the end, but uh, we're really interested in comments and feedback on our plan. It's out and uh, open until 20th of February this month. So please do look at it online. There's a simple kind of web-based form for you to respond to the questions that we pose. Uh, so what does the plan say? As you might expect, it says that we have a problem. We have a challenge. We have a long-term challenge, but those challenges are now starting to bite. And urgent action is needed by all water-using sectors in the east of England to manage the region's scarce water resources. The chart on the left-hand side shows you by 2050 what uh, scale of deficits we will have by, say, by 2050 if we take no action. Um, and what does it mean in, in, in simple terms for the environment, for the economy, uh, for our communities? It means that, uh, well, we're already water stressed, first of all, the Environment Agency has already classified the whole of the east of England severely water stressed. 
uh, and that is coming through in the state of our, our, our natural environments. 92% of the rivers within the east of England are below good ecological status, and in many cases that's because there isn't enough water going through them to, to uh, support, to support uh, ecology, to, to uh, dilute nutrients. So water, sorting out water resources is fundamental to returning a lot of these rivers back to good ecological status. The scale of the deficit is absolutely huge. It's about a quarter of the amount of water we use today we will need to find again to meet uh, future res resource requirements. That's 640 million litres of water every single day, and that's shared across all sectors. That's not just for the water companies, it's predominantly for the water companies, but there's a big chunk in there, about 40 million litres per day needed for industry, for agriculture, for energy. And unless we take action, clearly there's going to be continuing uh, pressure on the natural environments. We're going to struggle to support sustainable housing growth. We're not going to have as much productive land within the east of England, let's face it. We're not going to be able to grow those high value, high quality crops that we do in parts of, of the east. And to say, you know, we've got such iconic natural, you know, areas of natural environment within, within the east, the broads. Um, all, all kind of the chalk streams that uh, crisscross our region. These are all internationally recognised uh, precious habitats that can only be uh, survive and sustained if we uh, provide them with enough water uh, running through them. First of all, in terms of what water we use today on the left-hand side and what water we will need in future on the right-hand side, clearly the public water supply does dominate the amount of water that we use at the moment, but about 80, 85% or so for the public water supply. But if you look at the kind of slighter, slightly lighter blue uh, chart, if I can wander and still be heard, um, spray irrigation, let's highlight that, first of all, it's very significant. This is an average figure across the year. When you get into those spring and summer months, particularly in certain catchments, then agricultural water use for spray irrigation is really quite significant indeed. It's also set to grow. It's going to grow by a sizable amount and a bigger amount than actually the public water supply is going to grow. And the error bars on the agricultural side of things is, again, quite significant because uh, climate change in some cases provides an opportunity for agriculture, you know, particularly in the east of England and further up in our region in Lincolnshire. Um, longer, drying, uh, sorry, longer growing seasons, but also hotter and drier. So if we're going to seize the opportunities of climate change in terms of agricultural uh, growth and, and yields, there has to be sufficient water because otherwise it's just going to become an increasing constraint. So the demand for water is going up, but the supply available from the environment is going to go down, and it's going to go down quite rapidly. Uh, first of all, in terms of the license caps and constraints that the environment agency is having to impose now in order to avoid that, uh, that really quite stark environmental situation getting any worse. So to avoid deterioration to those 92% so those of rivers which are already in, in pretty bad state, uh, the environment agency is having to impose license caps now. Uh, drought resilience is a clearly a really big challenge both for water companies and for uh, other water users. And so within our plan, we plan for the public water supply at least to be able to uh, withstand deeper droughts that we expect with climate change and provide a, a level of drought resilience uh, that, that means that uh, so kind of severe drought restrictions like stand pipes and rotor cups, rotor cups would only be imposed by the time we get to 2040 in a kind of one in a 500 year uh, drought, a drought event. Climate change, a progressive, a, a progressive loss of water over time as rainfall patterns become less dependable. Uh, in general, wetter winters, in general, hotter, drier summers, but we're going to see much less dependable rainfall patterns uh, and in becoming increasingly, capture, uh, increasingly difficult to capture the rain that does fall because it's going to fall in heavier bursts. And by the time we get to 2050, we don't want to just avoid rivers getting any worse. We want to improve them back to good ecological status. Uh, the government published, uh, the UK government this is, published its 25-year environment plan, its second uh, environmental improvement plan on Monday. And that reaffirms the, the national ambition to return at least 75% of rivers to as near a natural state as possible, as soon as possible. And that means, yes, say, finding the water resources to put back into rivers, abstracting less from groundwater and surface water sources, taking less from headwaters, perhaps more from downstream, and using the water that we have overall much more efficiently. And these are big numbers. These are big uh, losses of water to water companies and to other irrigators, to other water users, and happening, it's going to happen really uh, quite fast indeed, as I'll, I'll get, into, get onto it in a minute. And those are the kind of the average figures, I suppose, across the region. When you get into individual catchments, individuals kind of subcatchments of water bodies, those kind of average figures really start to bite hard. Uh, when you look at this, again, still at quite, you know, a, a, a wide spatial scale, thinking about river catchments, 
instead of a kind of 20 to 25 percent loss of mortar, you're talking about maybe a 40 to 40 to 60 percent, if not even a greater loss in mortar for individual catchments, for individual users. Across the top, we've got maps uh, relating to the public water supply, the four water companies within our region. Across the bottom, you've got the spray irrigators and how much water they may lose from their existing licenses by the time we get to 2050. And you've got three environmental scenarios from the kind of legal minimum on the left-hand side to the most ambitious environmental scenario where hopefully every river gets the water it needs to return to good health. And clearly, the more you want for the environment, the, the healthier you want river systems to be, the more water we have to prevent and stop abstracting from uh, surface and groundwater sources, and the more alternative su sources of supply we need to find. And if you drill into places like Suffolk, Essex, Norfolk, East Anglia clearly is on the front line of those challenges. And as I say in a moment, we'll, you know, the, those, the impositions, those license caps, constraints, hands-off flow conditions are, are beginning to be imposed absolutely uh, now and in, in the next couple of years. Uh, and just on that front, to say the Environment Agency has been um, pursuing a restoring sustainable abstraction program for some time now. Um, we at, at Water Resources East are involved in the Ant Valley in North Norfolk, trying to bring together partners to try and resolve some of these challenges uh, together as, as a collaborative, uh, in a collaborative way as we possibly can. Um, and in terms of when things might start to happen, this is a kind of snapshot as we understand it. In, in terms of you know, the Environment Agency's own plans for imposing certain licenses. So going back to 2018, there was a round of license cuts where many uh, abstractors had their licenses cut back to the kind of average peak use over the reference period, about 2000 to 2012, 2015, something like that. So they lost all the headroom in their licenses, so they will no, no longer be able to use any more than they have in, in years gone by. That's not going to be enough because that's just about avoiding the situation getting worse. So those same abstraction licenses could well be cut again at the next round of cuts in 2024. Uh, those are kind of time limited licenses which will be reviewed on a kind of rolling basis anyway. But permanent licenses, licenses of rights, are not immune to that process. And in the Ant Valley, as I mentioned, uh, there are 17 licenses that uh, abstractors are being served notice this month in early February. Oh, sorry, it is now February, isn't it? Uh, uh, if not already, in the next couple of weeks, to tell them that by October 24, um, they will need to severely cut back their abstraction uh, from the groundwater sources because they impact the local sites of special scientific interest. And that, again, is only the start of it because the Environment Agency were taken to court last year uh, they were found to have not uh, applied the process as they should, and that judicial review means that the Environment Agency will have to extend the, uh, the area of search and review, review out to the entire broad special area of conservation. So that instead of looking at three triple SI sites of special scientific interest, they are now, over the next kind of 18 months or so, having to broaden that search uh, uh, right out. Um, and all permanent licenses by 2028 can be changed without compensation under powers that were included within the Environment Act, uh, Environment Act 2021. That means that uh, they will get far more notice. So hopefully, the Environment Agency will inform the abstractors who may be uh, who may be kind of subject to those changes in 2028 in the next year or two. But certainly, by the time we get to 1st of January 2028. Uh, there need no longer be any financial compensation for losing those licenses. And all licenses will become permits under the environmental permitting regime, perhaps, perhaps next year. Uh, we wait and see. And the Ant Valley Water Resources Strategy Group, so again, kind of drilling into um, the, the very localised issues for 17 abstraction licenses, abstraction uh, farm businesses, food manufacturing, also the water company, where they are lo losing their licenses imminently. They're being told this month, as I say, about the changes formally in the legal, legal process. Uh, they only have 28 days to appeal against those notices to the Secretary of State about whether or not they will be imposed. But otherwise, in the, um, the, the backstop is that by October 2024, those cases, uh, those, those abstractions will need to cease or be uh, severely curtailed. And partly just explaining uh, and uh, highlighting this example, because I think it is the kind of the thin end of the wedge. This is the starting point of a process that will start to bite more widely. You know, I showed you the chart of the parts of the East where these abstraction challenges are going to be the greatest. So I expect you know, beyond the broad SAC into the rest of Norfolk, into Suffolk, into Essex, these conversations are going to have to start happening if they're not already. And there will need to be these groups coming together where the Environment Agency, Natural England, the water companies, abstraction, abstraction groups, local industry, uh, local businesses can come together and try to find out you know, where are they going to get the water from in future. 
and partly just to avoid a fight in court. You know, that's the kind of backstop. They get served the notice. They can appeal to the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State is probably going to uphold those licence changes. And therefore, the constructive response to that is, well, OK, we've got a couple of years. We know what the challenge is. Let's try and find alternative source of water which is why, again, conferences like today are so important because they can show what is the art of the possible, what different approaches might work in different geologies with different, uh, yeah, different types of rock, rock formations, different opportunities in terms of aquifers. Uh, it's really interesting, obviously, the Felix Tow hydrocycle is talked about a lot, but those kind of uh, canals of sandy soils that might be able to store and recover uh, water is, is just a really exciting, uh, really exciting prospect. Water Resources East primarily uh, operates at the regional scale. As I said, our core, uh, core purpose is to create that regional scale plan that shows where water will come from in the future. I say for the public water supply, the answer is major storage reservoirs, it's desal plant, it's water reuse, it's transfers around the region. But that's, that's great for the water companies. They're going to be able to resolve their challenges with a, with a huge amount of investment going in through water company bills. But what does it mean for, uh, at the local level for individual clusters of farm businesses, for heavy industry, for the energy producers? Um, that scale of planning makes sense to do within, within catchments. And so Water Resources East also has a set of flagship projects which operate at that catchment scale to try and explore the different challenges and work out where the water may come from. Um, the North Water Strategy, for example, is looking at nature-based approaches to, uh, to capturing water, letting it infiltrate, uh, creating woodlands and wetlands that help with water quality as well as water resources. So more of a kind of using nature-based approaches at sufficient scale to shift the dial on things like water, water resources, water quality and flood risk management challenges. But partly because it's an interreg funded conference today and because Water for Tomorrow itself is an interreg funded project that Water Resources East is running with the Environment Agency again and the Rivers Trust and partners in France. I wanted just to kind of give you an early glimpse of some of the outputs which will be uh, published in the next couple of months. We've got our own conference coming up uh, in a month or so's time. Uh, water for Tomorrow, again, is looking at that catchment scale about where, uh, where will water come from in order to resolve the challenges that we foresee in future. So the starting point is, you know, what's the scale of the problem in this particular locality, in this vicinity? Uh, what local options may be available? Yeah, so it could well be the answers to you know, the different approaches that we're talking about today. But in general terms, is it about demand management? Is it about new sources of supply? Is it about rainwater harvesting and capture? Is it about sharing resources, sharing uh, abstraction licenses, abstraction uh, license trading? So what local options might be available? And then you put those two options together and, and test them in different scenarios. So in a, in a high climate change scenario, in a high environmental improvement scenario, which of these options perform best on a kind of cost benefit basis? And then how can we present those options to a lay audience, to individual, say, farmers and farm businesses in a way which allows them to play what if tunes and scenarios? You know, play in different scenarios, see what options perform best, and then hopefully that leads into more detailed planning on from there. In terms of understanding the scale of the challenge, this is where the Environment Agency have really been focusing their efforts in the East Suffolk catchment. So these maps are now available online on the Water for Tomorrow website. The website link is there in the bottom right hand side. And this is just one map amongst many covering the catchments within, within East Suffolk. And I just wanted to highlight again, uh, again, when you get down to a really localised uh, scale, some of those kind of averages we were talking about really become acute. So the pink uh, catchment, which you can see in the middle, is the River Gipping catchment. On these maps, which they say all published online, you can see the, the dots and the triangles which show you whether they're groundwater licenses, surface water licenses, licenses right, time limited licenses, and the public water supply abstraction uh, points in larger squares. For this particular catchment, it shows you how much water is being abstracted at the moment, so how much is licensed and actually abstracted. So let's look at the numbers 22,000. Uh, cubic metres of water per day. Uh, it splits down prim prim you know, primarily for the public water supply, but there's also a big chunk for industry in this sector, but also spray irrigation. And then when you look to the future, again, this is you know, broad brush assumptions. You know, we can't um, say this is exactly what will happen. Again, when you get down to individual abstraction licences, there's more detailed modelling that would need to go on behind that. But again, it gives you a scale of the challenge. So if we're going to move this catchment to a more sustainable state where rivers become uh, back in good ecological status or you know, back toward that, instead of 22,000 uh, cubic metres, we need to move down to 
2,000 cubic meters. So again, a huge loss of license, about 90% loss of groundwater abstraction uh, and license volumes by 93%. Are we gonna get to that by just capping time limited groundwater licenses to what's been used in the past, the peak level that's been used in the past? That will only get you 0.3% of the way. So if we've got these questions about, is there scope for new abstraction licenses to be granted? No. How much groundwater abstraction licenses might need to be reduced by to protect the environment in this catchment, where we're starting, the starting point is 90%. Will capping time limited licenses to max peak historic usage be sufficient? Well, it's probably already been done, which is why it's not gonna get you there. So again, understanding the scale of the challenge, these kind of tools through Water for Tomorrow, um, uh, Water Resources East, we're trying to at least explain what's coming. You know, we can't say for certain exactly how much will be impacted for individual abstractors, but clearly there are some very significant challenges down the track. Getting into what the options might be, this, this is our catchment management tool, which again is it's a beta version, so it will, you know, it will look better than this, but it gives you an idea that if you, if you drill into particular parts of Norfolk in this case, if you play in certain climate change, weather patterns, environmental scenarios, and then you play in different demand management scenarios, winter storage, abstraction licensing options. You put all that data in and you run the models and it tells you whether or not this for that particular catchment is going to work or not. Again, quite, quite simplistic tools, but yeah, in order to engage a lay audience to make these kind of choices quite clear and quite plain, it's hopefully going to be a helpful tool to help people understand those different trade-offs that they have. And there are trade-offs to be had because you know, different sets of options, they cost more, they cost less. They provide more water, or maybe they don't provide as much water. And also a critical uh, consideration is how resilient will that water supply be in different weather patterns with climate change or you know, depending on what happens uh, day to day and year to year. And I've highlighted the blue lines, there's lots of different options, lots of different combinations of you know, supply side options, demand side options, you play them all into the model. And I've just highlighted in red and in purple two, two particular sets of options. The red is very cheap. It produces a whole load of water, fantastic, but it's not very reliable. So you're gonna get a lot of water and then they get, you're gonna be probably the first in the catchment to be cut off. Is that enough? Maybe that's, that will work for many people, but not all. Or there's the purple set of options, which is more expensive. You don't get as much water, but it is pretty reliable. Maybe that's a winter storage reservoir saying you, you invest in it, you get that water and you're probably always gonna get that water because hopefully you'll be able to fill it during the winter time when uh, water should be available. So those are some of the tools, the maps, uh, the, the tools that let you play off these different options and scenarios to understand the different choices that you might face at a local level. Um, but going back up to the regional scale, we did make some, uh, a series of recommendations within WRE's plan to government primarily in order to improve the situation with water resources planning to help people look ahead to the future and understand the choices that they have. First of all, it's great that actually the government has now written to all the regional groups, Water Resources East, the other four regional groups to confirm that we will have a second round of regional planning beyond the one that we're kind of toward the end of now that we will keep going for another five years given how valuable that process has been. We also need to make sure that across the country we are using water much more efficiently, much more uh, kind of efficient new development, uh, capturing things like rainfall and, and grey water for recycling use for use uh, locally. Um, and so government policy on demand management to make our washing machines, dishwashers, tap showers, toilets more efficient, that absolutely has to be part of the answer. But also we need to make sure that the regional groups can continue our work to look multi-sector and not just focus on the big stuff, the big public water supply stuff, but also on the more uh, localised issues for different abstractors who face really quite severe challenges in that, in that locality. And we also, as far as possible, the encouraging the environment agency, encouraging government to give as much certainty as they can to abstractors about what the future looks like, what the reforms will be, uh, when certain things will be implemented, and what the scale of the challenge might be when those changes are made. And also, given the uncertainty around how much environmental improvement is cost effective, and those different trade-offs between supply resilience and environmental improvement, uh, we want the government to fund a kind of single approach to looking at uh, how, what, what is the best way to improve the environment across the country to restore rivers to good ecological status, but a way that's, that serves all sectors' interests and is done as, as kind of cost-effectively as possible with as wide uh, kind of multi-sector benefits. And so that, that integrated approach to long-term environmental improvement is, is really, really necessary. 
And just sector level recommendations, farmers and growers, you know, as part of our membership, they absolutely want to see long term security over abstraction licenses, again, linked into that certainty question. You know, they want to know how much, uh, how much water they might lose and what their options might be for dealing with it. Uh, just thinking about energy generation as well, we don't talk about energy companies very much. They've got lots of resources in-house, including their own planners, to think about this. But we are in the transition to a net zero energy grid. A lot of the uh, aspects of that in terms of hydrogen production, carbon capture and storage, these are all water intensive processes. Where's that water going to come from, particularly in places like the east of England? So that's clearly a, a consideration uh, for them. I mean, talking about the regional economy, again, making sure our new development is water efficient as possible and promoting things like rainwater harvesting and grey water recycling, which certainly in this country is really, it, it's a niche product. It's not, the, it's not the norm by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, within the east of England, we're blessed with internal drainage boards, which manage those lowland, land, lowland landscapes, uh, primarily for drainage and flood risk management purposes. But we would like to see their role extended into kind of integrated water management in the landscape for the benefit of not just nature and farming, but also carbon sequestration, restoring uh, lowland peats, and you know, making the best use of those skills and the planning and expertise that's available at the local level. So that's it from me. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Jay, just to promote the regional plan itself on WRE's website, the consultation is open until the 20th of February and encourage you all to respond and tell us what you think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for that very interesting uh, summary. Don't go away. Um, because we are, we've now got a bit of time in the, um, in the uh, programme to, for people to ask questions, so don't slow down. If you've got a question and you want to ask it, then please put it into Slido now, um, whether you're online or, or in, the, uh, in the audience. Um, but we have got a couple of questions. Um, the first one that's come in um, is talking about the, Im the economic impact of the removal of um, abstraction licence and is asking if any analysis has been done um, in terms of what that means to, yeah. the, to our economy. I mean, that's essentially what those charts show. So um, moving from the left-hand side, the legal minimum, to the right-hand side obviously incurs additional costs, but also additional benefits. So that in itself is an economic analysis at that scale. Obviously, we've got river basin management plans, which look at the, the health of individual river systems. Uh, set objectives for improving those, uh, those water bodies. And part of that, again, is an economic assessment of, of whether it's cost effective to, re to return that water body to good health. So it's happening at that scale as well. And then when it comes to individual license constraints, the Environment Agency will talk about this, I'm, for, I'm sure, uh, and know much more about this than I do, but they will then also apply an economic assessment of you know, what's the best way of returning that water body to good health. Um, but there is that backstop of no deterioration because mm. clearly the Water Framework Directive you know, as retained le uh, legislation following uh, European exit, um, that does need to be met. So uh, yeah, clearly there is, there is no avoiding the need to avoid, say, further harm to the environment, but certainly cost, ass cost assessments, cost effectiveness comes in about how, by, by, what much you, you, by how much you improve river bodies in future. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Second question, um, are other regions with less water scarcity um, pushing for similar solutions in their respective areas or is East of England a sort of lone voice in that because of our particular situation? No, not at all. So every, every region of England will face its own particular challenges. I think um, obviously water resources southeast, which covers London and the whole kind of area around Hampshire, Kent, uh, Sussex, Surrey, uh, has really quite severe challenges with the public water supply, with growth. Uh, they're also building new reservoirs. They've already got one desal plant. So they're thinking about building more. Uh, the West Country, the Southwest, Cornwall, Devon, which you might think is quite a wet part of the world, it is. But in kind of uh, relative terms, they don't have as, as much access to kind of water storage as we have within the East. And they really suffered during the droughts that we've, that we've had over the last six months and are continuing still to be in uh, this year. And I think it's worth recognising that you know, we talk about 1976 as the last time that a severe drought happened and, and hit the UK, as I'm sure it did overseas as well, um, that we're not, in 19, so we're not in 1976 yet. We're in 1975, which is the year that no one talks about, which is the really dry year that made 1976 such, you know, so impactful. And it, you know, everyone's got their eyes on the rain gauges, everyone's got their eyes on groundwater levels, and in some parts of the country, they're not recovering as quickly as we need to in order uh, to, uh, 
um, avoid even more severe restrictions by the time we get into the summer. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. Uh, questions are still coming in. So um, what consultation is taking place with the housing development companies considering the demand for new housing upon water? Are they listening? Uh, yeah, they are certainly listening and they're having to listen because this is becoming uh, increasingly a challenge for, for housing development in parts of the country. Uh, so in, uh, in the north of Sussex, there is a part of uh, those catchments where the natural England have said there cannot be any more abstraction from this catchment without avoid, you know, to, in order to avoid further deterioration. So new housing development has to be water, water neutral. Like carbon neutral, it means that any additional water that that housing might need has to be offset with water efficiency savings within that same water body zone. And I suspect that water neutrality will start to bite other parts of the region. You know, for example, in Cambridgeshire, massive, massive growth, about 24% extra homes to be built in their area over the next 25 years. Uh, Cambridge Waters Plan, uh, Anglian Waters Plan, has a huge amount of leakage control, demand management, new water resources, but some of those options won't come through until the mid-2030s. So how do we manage that, uh, that, um, that demand for growth, that new housing that's going to be popping up in that region over the next 10 years? Brilliant. Thank you. Um, are you planning any social transitions um, to impact public water use, like changes to pe how um, people or consumers think about water? Uh, yeah, it, indeed. So I think everyone has a part to play in this, and I think for too long, water has been somewhat taken for granted. Mm. Um, I think when you ask the average person on the street how much water they use, they massively underestimate their own personal consumption. Uh, the average, certainly in England, is about 140 litres per person per day. If you ask the person on the street, it, they say about 40 or 50 litres. Um, you know, my daughter, I, I have a smart meter, and my daughter, I, I shamefully admit that my daughter <laughs> used 500 litres in a shower just recently. We've got quite an efficient shower head. Um, and just people have no <laughs> comprehension. So, yeah, um, so the, the government is introducing... Uh, product labels on, on, on water using products so you can choose between a really you know, wasteful product and an efficient product so they'll be A rated through to F uh, washing machines and dishwashers as well and water companies are rolling out smart meters like the one I already have which which shows your consumption every hour instead of maybe once or twice a year that will be given to people through a smartphone portal so they can understand exactly how much water they're using and when and hopefully with an incentive to, to reduce it. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I think, we, yeah, we have still got some time for some more. So um, Bart's asked, um, does nature have primacy when taking decisions um, to restrict extractions? Uh, yes and no. As I say, under the Water Framework Directive, uh, the Environment Agency has a, a legal imperative to make sure there is no deterioration. So in those circumstances, they have to impose licence caps that bring water bodies back into it's, it's the restoring sustainable abstraction programme. That what's, that's what that is all about. I think when it comes to then improving the environment back toward, uh, say, rivers returning to good health, which we all want to see, uh, the government has set a target not for 100% of all rivers to return to good health, but for 75%. And clearly that means that there will need to be some priorities. We'll have to think about the costs in some cases. And that's why it's important that we've said that we need to investigate at a much more detailed scale exactly what should be done where. In some cases, it might not be stopping abstraction, or it might be in combination with river restoration schemes to improve, uh, you know, re-meander re rivers, uh, restore uh, reed beds, and the way in which waters move through catchments. And the general principle has to be slowing water down, uh, storing it where we can, storing it in the landscape, re-wetting soils, improving, uh, you know, decreasing soil moisture deficit, so restoring peatland soils. All these things, I think, deliver such greater, kind of wider benefits for biodiversity and for carbon. Um, and also, but clearly, you know, reductions in groundwater sources has to be part of the picture. Yeah. We've got a clock in front of us ticking down, <laughs> and we've got two questions left, so I think we can probably just about do it. Um, so how does nutrient neutrality affect, affect the plan? Um, I suppose that's probably that as an open uh, Well, yeah, so as I say, particularly in Norfolk, we are focusing on nature-based solutions that can deliver these wider objectives. So actually the programme started off looking at water resources, so uh, infiltration, uh, so small-scale aquifer recharge, uh, you know, storage and recovery. 
Um, but when neutral neutrality, so, uh, you, um, actually, why am I lecturing the Dutch about neutral neutrality, <laughs> given that's the legal case, wasn't it, that started this all off? So neutral neutrality, in short, means that, uh, again, new housing development going into a catchment, the additional nutrient loads those, those housing, uh, housing will impose has to be offset within the same catchment to make sure that development can proceed. Uh, but nature-based approaches, again, are a really great way of releasing or capturing uh, nutrient loads, phosphorus, uh, uh, nitrates, and in many cases you can deliver benefits both for water resources and for nutrient neutrality if you're thinking about woodlands and wetlands and kind of sustainable urban drainage schemes and these other approaches. So we are looking at exactly where within these catchments that uh, nutrient neutrality has been posed mm -hmm. for the right kinds of nature-based solutions in the right places in order to unlock development. But we hopefully, it's not just about avoiding it getting worse, what we obviously want to do is actually cut down on the, the, the two high levels of nutrients that are already within the environment, so that, again, to help nature recover. Yep. Great. Have we identified the communities that are at high, highest risk to water scarcity? Uh, have you seen the map? It's red everywhere. I mean, it's very hard <laughs> to say you're, you're at risk and you, you aren't. Um, so I think everywhere has a challenge. And I think clearly in our, our plan for the public water supplies, all these water resource zones are going to be connected up. So there won't be a kind of national grid for water, but within the region there's a, there's a bulk supply pipeline that will connect up. It threads its way through the catchments from the north in Lincolnshire down through uh, Norfolk, Suffolk and into Essex. And therefore, you know, it becomes a shared challenge across all the different communities in the east of England about using less water, uh, you know, accepting when we have to build uh, desal and reservoir projects and you know, making sure they're built in the right places. But clearly those kinds of major infrastructure schemes will be needed. Uh, and also, say, when it comes to new development, making those homes as water efficient as they mm. can be. And the next question, which yeah. is about rainwater harvesting and grey water recycling, which uh, there was a requirement to, or at least a, an incentive for house builders to include those systems back in 2008. And sadly, the government about 10 years ago uh, ruled that requirement out. I think we've suffered as a result. Yes, something that we're definitely going to have to think about in the future, yeah. I think. Excellent. Thank you very much. We're pretty much bang on time so that's very well done <laughs> Daniel. it's nothing to do with me yeah, all down to you. Good, thank so you thank you so much for your uh, presentation and he's even progressed the slide onto the right one without me touching it so that's uh, top marks to daniel um now we're going to men welcome uh, neil's onto the stage um no we're not actually because i'm going to start the um the uh a video that Neil's um, organisation, Dow, has produced to, uh, to show you a little bit about their project. And then Neil's will come on stage after that. So a good job I remembered. Dow has this initiative taken in a project Fresh for Seas, because we are in a waterschaarst gebied gevestigd. Zijn. Dow has for ogen staan om in the winter months het overtollige regenwater op te vangen en op te slaan. En dan in the droge zomerperiode het water te gebruiken en dat willen samen doen met onze lokale landbouwers, zodat iedereen van het opgeslagen regenwater kan profiteren. Dow heeft uiteindelijk tussen de 300 en 400.000 kub extra zoetwater nodig in de droge periodes van het jaar. Gecombineerd met de opslag voor de landbouwers die een behoefte hebben tussen de 100 en 200.000 kub per jaar, zullen we uiteindelijk een kleine miljoen kub extra zoetwater op moeten slaan om aan deze behoefte te kunnen voldoen, omdat we slechts 50% van het opgeslagen water her kunnen gebruiken. De belangrijkste reden om hier aan mee te doen is voor mij om meer te leren over de, hoe het water in de ondergrond werkt en zo, hoe het beweegt. En zoet water hebben we ook nodig voor onze teelt. De laatste jaren zien we steeds vaker dat we droge voorjaren hebben en natte najaren. En in droge voorjaren willen de plantjes niet beginnen groeien, zeg maar. ze hebben water nodig. En als we zoet water uit de ondergrond kunnen halen, dan helpt dat. De demo op het land hier zo werkt als volgt. We doen water in de drainage laten infiltreren en door het grondwaterpeil van het zoetwater omhoog te doen, drukken we het zoutwater verder naar beneden en wordt de voorraad zoetwater groter. De voorzieningen die nodig zijn voor infiltratie en onttrekking zijn samengestelde drainage om het water de bel van de kreker in te laten lopen en diepdrains om het eruit te kunnen zuigen en metaregeltechniek. Wij zijn heel nauw betrokken bij deze casus in Braakmanzout. Uh, we kijken uh, voor een geschikte bron van water die gebruikt kan worden als uh, infiltratiewater in dit kreekhoek infiltratiesysteem. 
Uh, maar daar moeten we echt kijken naar de kwantiteit van de water en de kwaliteit. Die is heel belangrijk, omdat er heel strenge regels zijn voor de kwaliteit van water die in de grond gestopt wordt. Dus we werken samen met uh, de waterschap om een goede monitoringplan uh, op te stellen en uh, te kijken of de, de water aan de ijzerpool doet. We hebben wel studenten die een bijdrage kunnen leveren aan dit project uh, in allerlei uh, vormen, stage of kleine onderzoekjes. En we hebben momenteel studenten die werken aan, specifiek aan dit casus voor ons. En ze kijken naar eh, bronnen van overtollig oppervlaktewater in de regio en wat is de kwaliteit van die bronnen. Het is een uh, grensoverschrijdend project, dus wij leren um, over de uh, verschillende waterbeheersaanpak in drie verschillende landen. En we vergelijken dat uh, met Nederland. Uh, we hebben ook uh, interviews uitgevoerd met verschillende stakeholders en lokale belanghebbenden. En daar zien we um, over de landen uh, wel overlap, maar ook veel verschil. Everest is uh, geïnteresseerd in uh, Fresh for Seas, omdat het een uh, innovatief traject is wat direct in de omgeving gebeurt en wat ook uh, ja, onze activiteiten raakt en we hopen daar uh, aan bij te kunnen dragen. Uh, bij Fresh for Seas zijn er een aantal uitdagingen die wij zien, uh, het maatschappelijk draagvlak de economische haalbaarheid natuurlijk, maar ook andere zaken zoals past het ecologisch en de andere ruimtelijke plannen die er zijn. Dus er zitten natuurlijk wel een aantal uitdagingen op het project, maar we hopen dat dat uiteindelijk allemaal geslecht gaat worden en dat het haalbaar is. Het is voor landbouwers zeker goed om bij dit project betrokken te zijn. Als de landbouwers zelf ook gebruik kunnen maken van het zoetwater, is het zeker een win-win situatie. De verwachting is dat er in de toekomst veel zoetwater nog nodig zal zijn. Gezien de weersextremen die je toch ieder jaar weer ziet, zullen de droge periodes in de zomer toenemen. En zal waarschijnlijk in Zeeuws Vlaanderen toch echt zoetwater nodig zijn om de gewassen te laten groeien. En ZHTO wil graag de samenwerking met de industriële partijen verder onderzoeken om de expertise van deze partijen vanuit ZHTO, maar ook vanuit de industrie te kunnen gebruiken. Zeker als er nog zoet water geloosd wordt op de Westerschelde, zou het mooi zijn als landbouwers het kunnen gebruiken. Thanks very much. Uh... Hope you enjoyed the video to, to start with. Um, so I'm Niels Groot, I'm with the Environmental Tech Center in, in Dow. Um, and actually I'm stepping in today for, for Carmen Hood, who's our project lead, but who couldn't make it uh, due to illness. Um, but I'm glad to tell you a little bit about our, our case study. Dow to start with, Dow is a US-based chemical company um, with a large manufacturing location in uh, Tameuse in the Netherlands, as you can see on the map. Um, We, we employ about 3,000 people at that location, operating 17 different plants. And for these processes, we, we do need a lot of water, a lot of fresh water. Uh, roughly 20 million cubes on an annual basis, which is three to four times more than the whole regional public demand. So we, we are and feel responsible for, for that situation. And that's why we, uh, we started to, to, to implement quite a number of uh, reuse schemes over the past two decades, um, together, mostly, most of them together with our local water provider, Evides Water Company. Um, we recycled water from our own wastewater treatment plant, recycled water from the city's wastewater treatment plant, uh, reused a lot of steam condensates on, on our own premises. And as you can see in the pie chart, there's also a portion coming from, from surface water, which is at the, at, at the at a little south east southwest side of this which is actually uh, a number of reservoirs Evides owns uh, to store excess rainwater from from Belgian polders uh, during winter time and that's that's a significant portion nonetheless we we still need quite a piece of of what we call Beesbos water which is a precious water source predominantly for potable water uh, in the southwest of the Netherlands and, and long term we don't want to compete with that source because We know the climate change uh, impact and, and, and we, we may have the situation that there is no water available for industries from that source. And that's why we are in the, uh, in the process to replace that, that water by different sources. Nonetheless, at the, at the end, once, even when, once that's implemented, we still might face water shortages during summer times, during short periods. And that's why we stepped into Fresh for Seas to provide a kind of backup situation for our uh, uh, summer periods. And 
and on this map, you recognize maybe, and again, these reservoirs I just showed you uh, from Evidas, and, and these play a role in this, in, in this sales solution space. This is called Brakman South. Uh, and in this area, we, we want to explore the opportunity to, to use creek recreative filtration. Uh, you saw the principle in the, in the video just before, which was showed by Bastian, and you will hear a lot more details uh, uh, from Anne Wiersma this afternoon. But use creek recreative filtration to, to store water in winter times, which comes, uh, say, from, an, from a suitable source. And then reuse it during, uh, during summertime, during drought periods, together with farmers in the region and uh, by that solving our and their problems. Um, in this project we, uh, we did a feasibility study to, to see how we could implement a large-scale say system to, to, to contain about a million cubes of, uh, of fresh water during winter time and abstract half of that during summer and, and conduct a demonstration uh, to see if we can establish the, say, the design criteria for such a full-scale system. Um, and with that, I, I also want to acknowledge our, our project partners here, of course, all the colleagues in DAO who participated, but especially also Hazard University, who did, played a major role in many of the aspects, in monitoring, in uh, setting up the permit requirements, um, but also in exploring freshwater sources in the region. And yeah, a few of the observer partners are also instrumental. Uh, Evides Water Company, I mentioned them already as a water provider in the region and owner of a number of assets, infrastructure, um, but also the water board and, and the farmers, of course. They play a, role, a major role because they say have the land and provide that for, for use in this, in this demonstration and possibly in future implementation of the large scale system. And ZLTO is the organization which represents all these farmers. You saw the lady in the video as well, uh, expressing their interest in this, in this project. So, moving on, um, we did the first feasibility study and Deltaris was very instrumental there. They, uh, they made a map for the whole region and you see the green spots on the map, which actually show the, the areas which are predominantly uh, suitable most likely for creek creeks infiltration. So that's where we selected a number of farmers in during some, some of these workshops and started talking to them and then finally selected two and you can see them in the, uh, in the areas which are uh, with dotted uh, red lines um, to install field measurements to find more details on, on, the, on the soil uh, properties, on the groundwater levels, the soil gradients and so on. And then finally, uh, agreed with one of the farmers upon a uh, demonstration location, which is then shown here, very close to, that, uh, to those reservoirs, which was, a, which was very helpful because these reservoirs could be used to, to take the water during the demonstration and infiltrate in a natural way into the soil. Um, the size was about three and a half hectares, and with 50% uh, recovery, we deemed to, to infiltrate about 10,000 cubic meters during the winter season to abstract half of that during summer. Um, infiltration was done naturally in the drainage pipes and for the, uh, for the abstraction during summer we had to install uh, deep drains which are at the five, six meters low uh, to, to withdraw water from the, from the bubble. Uh, the freshwater bubble, uh, the intention as, as mentioned in the uh, in the video was to, to grow the freshwater bubble by infiltrating water on top of it and then abstracting it from the bottom. Um, you see the, the, the boreholes which were installed to, to monitor all the, uh, all, the, all the water qualities, the, uh, the groundwater levels and so on. And the, at the right side also the infiltration equipment to, uh, to infiltrate fresh water into the bubble. And, and in the graph you see that we gradually moved on throughout the year throughout the winter period to, uh, to, to achieve that 10,000 cubic meters uh, in the bubble. Actually, we didn't see the result of a really growing bubble afterwards, even not after uh, abstraction. We did see that, that, it, that the bubble kept intact. So that gave us confidence that it's, that it's working, but it just may need some more time to, more, more years actually, to, to substantially grow that bubble. Uh, the surroundings are a little bit 
uncertain. It may be that some of the water is still flo floating, say, to, to the sides of the bubble. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's still something we have to pursue. And the intention is also to continue that, this demonstration for the next five years. Okay, then on water sourcing, in parallel with the demonstration, uh, our colleagues of AZ, they, they looked at the uh, suitable sources for that one million cube, which need to be stored in the wintertime. Um, and if you look at the map again, this here is the demonstration site, and we have the reservoirs here. And these reservoirs are filled by, if it is what the company through their infrastructure, uh, represented by this red line. And actually, that's coming from a few polders in Belgium. And you see a picture here, which is actually uh, pretty precious uh, fresh water, which they, which they use um, to fill these reservoirs. And five to six million of that, of that water is annually used by Dow as, as industrial water to, to support the processes. And, and very close to this, this, this region, so this, this would some, be somewhere the area which we, where we would want to have a large-scale system implemented. Um, there were actually three different sources to, to, be, to be looked at. Uh, the canal here, it's called the Isabella Canal, which comes from, from Belgium as excess rainwater. Um, we looked at that intensively, but it appeared that most of the years it was not suitable. Um, the salt content was too high and too, too variable. Um, it, it was really not a, not a trustable source. The next one is the Leopold Canal, which, is, which flows here, which has abundant water, but also there the quality was not, uh, was not that good. Um, salt, the salt content was, was fine, but there were some pesticides and some, some aromatics which are, which are in there, which was, would prevent infiltration. So then we finally looked at the, uh, at the source of Ifides in the cells if there would be any access to be used during winter time. And yeah, especially Barty made an extensive study there on, on, on this system here, how, how much water would be available in excess of what if it is already uses. And, and, and he found that, that, there's, that it's in most winters there's sufficient water to, to be used. Um, it varies between half a million and, and three or four million. So, in average, that would be sufficient to, over the years, provide that one million cubes which we would need for, for large-scale implementation. And on, based on quality, it was still not uh, suitable in all cases, but it was the best water we could find in this region. And it does definitely would require a little, uh, little pretreatment. And the major advantage here is we may use the infrastructure which is already there from Avidas. So large scale, just a very quick view on, on what we uh, want to do there. Um, the idea is to have 300 hectares in this whole region. And this is just an example, a calculation model, which, uh, which would require installation of drainage systems for infiltration, for abstraction, but also uh, pumps and equipment, monitoring stuff, and all that, all that, all that material. And, use as much as we can from the EVIDAS infrastructure. Um, and our price models give a pretty positive indication of about 35 cents to 50 cents per cubic meter, which is during water scarcity periods, not a bad price. I mean, normally they, farmers would not pay that probably sort of throughout the year, but when it's really dramatic, they, they would. Um, we're still working on the collaboration model, and you will hear more about that from uh, Ange this afternoon. Uh, what, what we did find as a lesson learned, uh, the, the, the permitting process is still very vague and, and, and um, not pretty well, very well defined. And so we need to work much more with the agencies and, and especially the water board to set up a, a system which is uh, suitable for, say, for future uses with these kind of innovative techniques. So in summary, it seems that the system we have foreseen should be uh, feasible and affordable, um, provided that we, that we can use a source which is already available, uh, do a mild pretreatment, and then uh, through creekless infiltration, use uh, water during summer, uh, either at the industry or at the farmers. 
And, and as you can see, mostly this water is already used uh, in, the, in the normal routing. And, and this would just be an addition and a pretty simple imp implementation of our access demand. Thank you. And if there are many questions, we will probably address that afterwards. Yeah, we're going to. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to hear from Edgar next um, about some water storage happening in the Netherlands. Um, and then we've got the final of the morning's demonstration um, to go through. Um, and then we'll invite all three to come down um, and talk. So if you've got questions that you want to ask um, to any three, then please put them in and we'll, we'll do that at the end. Edgar. Thank you. Um, Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl is an area located in Flanders, not the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, it's located near the city of Bruges. It's located between Bruges and the city of Ostend. It's, uh, let's say, formerly was an agricultural uh, area, mainly grasslands. Um, it's part of the Natura 2000 network, so there are habitat uh, objectives. In this area, we need to, um, to realize about 50 hectares of reed marsh. Right? For the target species, uh, marsh area, little bittern, great bittern, uh, spotted crake, and some other species as well. So, if we talk about reed marsh, we, we say rewetting, we say uh, raising water levels, storing water. Um, as I said, Quetzalcoatl is located in the polders, and the polders have a, a pecu peculiar uh, water, water management uh, system, and. Here you see the, the mean surface water level over the past 10 years from, from 1st of January to the end of the year. And here you see the, the level the height, which is indicated in meters TAW, which is a reference, uh, the reference in, in Flanders, in Belgium. And just to have an impression, the mean average sea level at the coast at Ostend is 2.3 meters TAW. So you see these figures go from 150 to 190, mean that this is all under average sea level. Um, that's why in winter, in, in the normal uh, management of water levels in, in the polders uh, for agricultural purposes, water levels are quite low, very low, yeah? because the excess precipitation, the excess surface water in winter is uh, evacuated towards the sea, either by pumps, in, which is the case in Quetzalcoatl, but there are also parts in the polders where it's uh, evacuated gravitationally. Um, this is done, well, if, if, if this is not done, then, then in fact most of the polders will, will, will just uh, uh, turn into wetlands and, and not uh, usable for agricultural practices. Uh, the reverse we see in summer, where water levels are high. So the water levels are high because, well, agriculture needs water. And also in, in, in many parts of the polders, this high water level is needed to suppress seepage of, of brackish groundwater to, to the surface. So this means we have a system that we evacuate uh, excess water during, uh, during winter. And in summertime, we, we, we maintain high level, but this level is maintained by means of uh, irrigation from external water. Hmm? Now, this system is, is not suitable to, for habitat uh, um, development, especially for, for reed marsh. Uh, we need to have uh, higher water levels in general but especially high water levels in winter and relatively lower levels in, in summer. Now, what would happen if we would just st stop evacuating this, this, this uh, uh, excess water in, in, in winter? Then we would get something like this, meaning we get, we get an inundation of the area, because this is uh, the area Quetzalcoatl. Um, we would get an inundation of, of more than 50 hectares, uh, Approximately 150,000 cubic meters would be stored during winter time in this way. Problem is that in Quetzalcoatl, uh, Quetzalcoatl is a flood area, meaning that it's, it's important that during periods, especially in winter, with uh, high precipitation, um, that uh, there is a buffer capacity in this area, meaning that, in fact, the, the spots you see here in, indicated is, are floods, uh, in, in periods with uh, high precipitation. So the storage capacity needed during floods is 
124,000 cubic meters, which is more or less the same as, in fact, the, the water level we need for, for the habitat, um, uh, habitat development. This means if we raise the water level just generically, we would lose, lose this buffer capacity, which is, of course, um, uh, not possible. That's why we start thinking about, start thinking about um, how can we manage uh, a surface water level rise in, in this way, ke keeping in mind that, that, that uh, the, the buffer capacity, then we st start dividing the, the area in, in, in different parts. This, this part and this part, we will optimize buffer capacity. There is a large buffer capacity here, and we will optimize it. In this part, we will maximize storage. And then the smaller part, maximize buffer capacity. Uh, now, for fresh for seas, it's the central part which is involved as a demo. So the demo fresh for seas is part of a larger uh, project, in fact. It's an integral part of it. Uh, so what are the object objectives uh, for the demo Quetzal and fresh for seas? Maximizing water retention uh, by means of... of uh, uh, surface water, keeping water in as much as possible during winter. Mm -hmm. And part of this water will infiltrate to the groundwater as well. So it's a combination of storing surface water and infiltration. Now, initially, we intended to, uh, to look at creek ridge infiltration as well, but due to uh, delays in permits, we, we have had to skip this. And in combination with uh, the, the, the maximizing for the water retention, uh, we want to retain or even increase buffer capacity during floods. Uh, back to the, the water level. So this is the current water level or the water level before. This is the water level we want to achieve after, meaning high water levels in winter, which are 70 centimeters higher than the current winter levels, and uh, lower levels during summer, but even 10 centimeters higher than current summer levels at this moment. This gives an impression of how the area will look like after this, uh, the measures we've, we've taken. Hmm? Uh, here, um, on, if you see, well, it, it, it's, it's practically dry. It's only during floods that that part of this, uh, the area is flooded. In the future, it, it will be inundated most time of the year. Um, so we end up with the fact that the demo site of Kretshage, there we will attain water levels of 230, which is approximately the average uh, sea level. And in the other part, uh, water level will be lower. The fact that it's lower means that there will be excess water which will be evacuated. Yeah? And by means of a wind uh, water mill, we were going to pump in excess or part of the excess precipitation, excess surface water in winter in uh, the demo site. Uh, just, um, well, this is dig digital height model. So you see that the inner side is low lying. This is the low lying part, it's about 10 hectares. It's surrounded by the creek ridge. Um, so what, what have we done? We've done excavation in part of this lower lying uh, part, just to, to, uh, to improve water storage capacity. Uh, we use this ground uh, for raising the level on the creek ridge, so deposited on the creek ridge. Um, and then we've installed the wind water mill um, in combination with a tilting weir. And these, the combination of these two, uh, with the combination of these two, we want to um, attain and maintain the water level we need for the habitat uh, development. Uh, these are some pictures of the construction of the water mill and the weir just after completion and here when it's operational. Uh, this gives an impression of the excavations we've done and the change, the landscape's change that it has taken place. So this is before, this is a picture taken at the same place after. Here in the back you see the, the windmill. This is, uh, gives a panoramic view on, on the site. So you see the creek ridge surrounding the central area of 10 hectares, uh, of which part on this picture is, is inundated. Now this part which is inundated 
is, um, is the part that's excavated. Now, this water level is, in fact, the minimum water level we want to have during summer for, 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 for needed for habitat uh, restoration, habitat development. Um, we've observed that pumping, uh, pumping capacity of the water mill is around 750 cubic meters per day. Maximum storage capacity, meaning the volume which can be filled within the site is more than 40,000 cubic meters, but the effective storage capacity is less because we won't go under the level of this uh, 1.90 meters TAV. Time to fill up uh, the area is 50 to 60 days. Uh, we estimate the infiltration uh, to be about 140 cubic meters a day, which means it's a little bit less than 20% of uh, the pumping capacity of the water mill. So, in conclusion, we've uh, generated an effective storage capacity of 36,000 cubic meters. Uh, we estimate uh, that we can infiltrate to the groundwater on yearly basis around 20,000 cubic meters. And there is an overall gain of 15,000 cubic meters of buffer capacity, which is in fact uh, um, uh, with the combination of, of, of uh, the part of the project area outside the Fresh for Sea demo site. And this is done um, with, uh, by creating, in fact, uh, optimal conditions for the habitat uh, development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edgar, and apologies for moving you to a different country temporarily. Um, so now we're going to invite Mariska onto the, the stage. Um, and if you haven't heard of Lamb Western, you've probably eaten some of their potatoes. So um, we'll take it over from Thank you. From, uh, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, Lamb Western. Uh, oh. Uh, produces uh, frozen uh, potato products and also dried products. So uh, the ziggies, the twisters, all invented by Lamb Weston. So you probably have eaten them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, England is one of our main markets. So uh, <laughs> for the audience over here, uh, at least, but also audience at home, uh, probably. So yeah, welcome and yeah, great that you're all here to listen to the demos uh, we did. We're very proud to be part of this uh, project. Um, if we look at our company, then um, yeah, we have six plants uh, in Europe, uh, six, uh, production sites, um, one nearby in Wisbeach. <laughs> um, the demo we did in Kruidingen, that's one of our largest plants. And we have three other plants in the Netherlands and one in Austria. That's where we are located. Potatoes are grown in, uh, also here. And it was actually uh, for us as a company also an eye opener because it, here it was the dry, was the, uh, the urgent one. So we focused first here, also drip irrigation uh, pilots. We started over here in the UK. Lots of people were thinking, huh? UK is always raining. How can it be so dry? But the water stress is now everywhere. Huh? Also in the Netherlands, it's, uh, yeah, it's getting uh, quite severe. So it's a very important topic for us as a company. Um, we um, use water in our uh, production process to, to wash the potatoes, to transport the potatoes, uh, to clean the processes. Um, we even use it as an energy source. We have a, a yeah, heat recovery system. So, yeah, we use a lot of water <laughs> in our process. Of course, we try to minimize that. So we have closed loops as well in the process, but still uh, we discharge effluent water. Um, and yeah, it's maybe not a lot as uh, some other uh, figures you just saw, but still it's available uh, probably and that's what we intended to investigate in this project. And besides that, um, yeah, I just put it in here. We all, the potato, of course, contains a lot of water. So we're also thinking about smart things, uh, how to recover that. Because if you see our factories, water damp, can we catch that? So that's also things we're working at. So if there are smart people here who have great solutions, let me know. Just to go back to the potato first. The potato is, of course, our most valuable resource. Yeah? Without the potato, we don't have products. We have a growing uh, market demand for our products. So it's important that we have enough uh, potatoes uh, to produce. 
if you compare the potato to other staple food, it's quite well. Eh? It has a low water footprint, uh, 95 liters uh, per kilogram. Uh, so that's a good start. <laughs> But still, it needs water because it's quite crucial also in the growing process. Um, and if you compare it, for example, for the, the sunflower, eh, which we also need to fry potatoes, they have a footprint of 5,000 liters a kilogram. So that's a huge difference. Uh, and then, yeah, I also mentioned here the amount of farmland we need eh, for the production of last year. Uh, then maybe focus a little bit more on the value of the water. Um, I don't know if you know this figure, but the 70 stands for uh, the earth which is covered, uh, the surface earth is covered with 70% of water, which 1% of that 70% is available as fresh water. And 70% of that 1% is used for crops, huh? so for agriculture. So it's quite crucial huh? for us. And yeah, we all need food, it's essential, <laughs> so yeah, it's an uh, important uh, topic and uh, within Lambwesten we uh, actually focused on water as first priority in our sustainability strategy from the start in 2009 already. So uh, I think that's a good thing. It's quite well uh, in everyone's mind uh, on our uh, organization but also in a supply chain because yeah, lack of water is a lack of um, yield uh, and with the drip irrigation uh, projects we did we learned that if you give the potato the water on the right <laughs> uh, period eh, because uh, what the, when they really need it you get a 12 percent higher yield so that's value eh? so let's talk about the value of water what we said okay let's redesign our um, yeah, our process, because like I said, we were working internally a lot, so okay, but we never looked outside. So uh, when we uh, joined this project, we saw, thought it would be very interesting to see, okay, what can we also um, yeah, do in our local system, yeah, so close to our factory in Kruiningen, to improve this. And on this uh, map, you see that we are currently uh, discharging in the sea, and that's of course salt water. Uh, so the first thing which we did is that we uh, investigated the ditches around our factories, factory there to see what's the salt level because uh, we pr uh, produce fries and our effluent water contains a chloride. Eh? So we thought it's very important to see if it matches. Uh, the water in the area was like 800 milligrams a liter and uh, our water is yeah, average 600 uh, milligrams a liter. It's various as well, of course. Yeah? So sometimes it can be a little bit higher, but it's quite well usable in the local system. So that was my first surprise because we were thinking our water might be too, too salt to use. We also had discussion, of course, with the farmers because they need that uh, water and would it be suitable for them? Uh, and there we learned that... Um, if it's uh, yeah, lower than 800, it can be used for potatoes, can be used for onions, can be used uh, for beets. For yeah, Actually, a lot of uh, vegetables grown in our area uh, can be used. Um, and uh, in this map, you see also um, yeah, that we are actually thinking about making a crane, because now we have a crane to the, <laughs> to the sea. And we thought, okay, maybe we should reverse it, eh? put it the other way around and uh, get it to a farmer. So uh, there's one big farmer uh, really close by, 300 meters, so that's very nice. <laughs> and uh, he was very enthusiastic about this project. And actually, during the years huh, we uh, discussed and we worked on this project, he became more enthusiastic because I don't know how it is in England, but in Belgium, uh, farmers are used to pay for water. In the Netherlands, mm, so, but it's changed over time. People now learn, and especially what you're also mentioning, it's not available. Uh, so, yeah, then it becomes uh, a, this is a big difference. And um, I think that's also good, eh? that also you need to redesign your brain. But we also find out that when we were talking with the water board about discharging it on the ditches, um, it became more expensive for us because it's more expensive to discharge on the ditch than to the sea. 
I think that's a design thing we also need to solve quickly. Because that would be ridiculous. Eh? If you do the right thing, it's more, it's more expensive uh, in a way. Um, and um, the other thing is that uh, what we need to redesign is um, awareness. Really awareness at all stakeholders and also... Uh, to redesign for flexibility. I think it's the great story you just uh, mentioned about your plan. I think it's great. So compliments for that. Is that we really need to be flexible on a local scale and make it adoptable for suitable situations in quantity in what you need as well. Because during the discussions with our farmers, we also find out um, because to Let's start here to remove, uh, to make sure we get it uh, in the ditches and the local waterways to the farmer. Um, we need to remove. Yeah? So we learned from the water board that we need to remove our phosphate and our nitrogen more than if we uh, uh, discharge on the Westerschelde. And uh, it's about for phosphate, we need to go to two milligrams uh, a liter, which is now on average 15. And for nitrogen, it needs to be lowered to 20, was it correct? Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's now 60. Uh, what we are allowed, but it's on average 30. So it's quite uh, different, but we can solve that because the techniques are there and we are currently expanding in our uh, location in Kruidingen. So uh, for the water, for that new production line, that's about 100 cubes uh, an hour. We can, we can implement that. So that's already currently happening. So I'm very happy about the company make the decision to place that there. So this also makes it possible to comply with uh, yeah, the, uh, the permits, uh, if it's uh, available uh, there. And um, yeah, what's interesting is that the discussions with the farmers and yeah, we not only had it with our uh, potato farmer, but also with fruit companies. They all want our water. That became very clear. And uh, they also said, okay, why do you remove all these uh, things? Because we need to go also to um, yeah, more nature-based fertilizers. So we removed the phosphate, the struvite. Uh, we uh, did it. We had one of the first installations installed uh, in the Netherlands. It's quite old, so we're going to replace it currently. We're busy with that. We get pellets, so it's very important. So also there's improvement. But how can we also get the organic matter, which is very important for the soil. Eh? The health of the soil is very important. A lot of people eh, are not aware of that, but water is essential eh, to have a good, healthy soil, but also, of course, uh, organic matter. Eh? And that is also of dry periods. The wind blows yeah, and everything is away. So it's very important to have good care. We have a growers program, a sustainable growers program, in which we also work together with them and uh, yeah, try to work together to make sure that uh, it's, yeah, the health is good enough to get uh, production. So I think we also need to think about this one. It's not solved yet, huh? so it's something we will work on uh, the next years as well. If that would be possible to really make it suitable and flexible and also controlled, monitored. I think we have so much smart system eh, at the moment that we can do it. I'm convinced we can do that. Uh, so the, then the last thing we need to look at was how to transport it. So um, at first you saw in the dry periods, like the first dry period I was at Lambeste was in 2018. It was really dry summer. And then um, yeah, farmers, they called, can we get uh, the water? So we were calling uh, the water board um, uh, and our environmental agency and said, okay, can we do that? Now, that was not allowed. So um, we were not able to do that, but we were also discussing with the farmers, okay, is it a good idea to do it by, by road? And then it's very expensive because if you need to, if you need water eh, for your crops and, you, and it's not coming out of the sky, then you need to have three milligrams eh, on your whole terrain uh, three times. So that's quite a lot of water. So that means a lot of road transport and that's quite expensive. Also, of course, with uh, the prices of uh, nou ja, fossil fuels, eh, uh, energy and that. So um, that's not the way forward. So. We started with uh, the ditches because I prefer natural-based solution as well. Um, so that's what we tried. First, uh, that's possible, but 
we need to uh, make sure that we are in the current in the right stream because everything uh, can I show that here it's going down automatically here so we had to pop in over here to make sure we are in the it's going to the uh, to the land of the growers otherwise it's going down and it ends in the sea anyway so that's not smart of course then we don't have a good solution there and um, because we were um, uh, busy with our new production line we also needed incoming water we also have evidence water from the beach bells same as Dow eh? because we're one area that's the only source we have <laughs> in Zeeland um, and um, they also needed to make an effluent line so we were really thinking about can we make work from work and maybe we could also add our effluent uh, pipeline to make sure that it's going to the right uh, grower uh, growers in that area but there we also need to i think redesign a little bit because in legislation uh, if someone is a uh, landowner is not allowing you to uh, cross his land yeah then it's considered wastewater so it's not essential so that's difficult so that's also something we are working on to solve so because then we can make the cost of course uh, lower and we can even bring it further because during the discussions we also discussed about with evidence they have a yeah it's an agricultural pipeline is from the past and um, maybe we could plug in over there so we were also discussing with another uh, company Coros, which is on the other side of the canal but really close to us they uh, produce potato products of uh, sorry uh, vegetable project so they've kind of the same water and they also are busy with these projects so we thought okay then we can add this uh, pipeline but that's also not possible at the moment because they use it as uh, yeah yeah as a, a back, backbone also for other water so we really need to think together i think that's most important that's what we really learned in this project about resilient solutions especially locally uh, and yeah make it happen because it's very important uh, to do but the, yeah the great thing is that we are going yeah we we showed that we can do it it's possible um and we are going to do it, but we have lots to learn also to make it smart and to really continuously use all the water in our, eh, in our plant, with our local uh, communities. So that's what we strive for uh, in the next uh, years to come. <laughs> so thank you very much. I have a little movie which yeah, uh, summarizes our findings. Yeah, thank you. is not working. <laughs> How to design local circular water systems in water stressed areas. As a potato processing company, we are fully aware of the water usage in our supply chain. And to take our responsibility, we have clear commitments to reduce our water footprint by 2030. Our main resource, the potato, needs water to grow and will get stressed when there is not enough fresh water in the fields. As part of our sustainable agriculture plan, we work together with our growers on water irrigation management and we share best practices to decrease water usage. During our water treatment process, we filter reusable ingredients. Due to rising sea levels in the coastal areas, the surface water is becoming more salty and is not fresh or sweet enough to use as irrigation water for agriculture during dry periods. The Interreg program, Fresh Four Seas, gave us the opportunity to work on a project for three years to find a technical solution that really supports the local growers during summertime by distributing effluent water to the growers and increase their fresh water sources. Our investigation, analysis and stakeholder sessions resulted in some learnings.
We found out that the low salt levels of our effluent water makes it suitable to use for the crops in our area, potatoes, onions and carrots. Transporting water from the factory to the grower by road or by a new pipeline is very expensive. We came to the conclusion that there are three opportunities. Retain the water by transporting it via the ditches for water buffering to be used in dry periods. For this solution, we will need an investment. Install extra equipment to make sure the water is free of microbacteria and Legionella for safe use by the farmers. And we can bring the water via the ditches back to nature and use smart solutions to hold the water for a longer period by reusing it in our own processes. With the support of Fresh Four Seas, we can take these next steps to support our growers and to contribute to our commitments to reduce our water footprint by 2030. Thank you, Marika. Um, so now, if I can invite um, the speakers that have spoken already to come back onto the stage, um, then we can um, we can start the questions, and we've got lots. <laughs> grab a seat. I'll grab this one. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think we will start with. Um, one for Dow. Um, so, working in tra in a transboundary uh, region, how are you impacted by transboundary issues, and which of those issues, um, which of the barriers to transboundary um, cooperation, should be dealt with in future projects? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a very good question. Of course, um, <laughs> um, yeah, we, we we recognize that we are in a, in a watershed which actually goes from uh, from from the Netherlands to to the to the middle of Belgium almost, uh, which which we should manage as an as a whole watershed in in the most smart way. And and many of us are uh, are looking, especially the industries in that whole region, are looking at what. What the impact will be of our, all our changes, the transitions in in, in, in the next decades, mm -hmm. energy transition, but also raw material transition, that will that will have a huge impact on on uh, on, on many things, um, but also on water. And, and it's still and and, and I I was glad to see say a slide in, of <laughs> of your region here that, that that you expect these changes as well, but it's. The variety of, of the predictions, how how much that impact will be, that that goes from here to there. Mm. So it's very hard to 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 already uh, make make projections of how mm -hmm. to cope with that. And uh, so that uh, we are really setting up uh, uh, collaborations within the whole watershed to 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 face that collectively instead of just each on our own. Yeah, it can't be done by itself. Yeah, it? mm. absolutely. Um, feel free to join if if you want to add um, to answers. Don't feel that you um, you should uh, stay silent. Yeah. So the next one, Edgar, um, what was the response to local farmers in the area considering considering the use of the the land, the change of use of the land that was happening? Yeah, <clears throat> I think I forgot to mention that that the land is completely owned by, um, uh, in fact, the Flemish government. Because, uh, in fact, we started with this project, it's, it's uh, 15 years ago, we started to acquire the land, which took, uh, on a voluntary basis, which took a lot of time. Uh, eventually, uh, I think three years ago, we managed to, to, to obtain, uh, to acquire all the land within the area. And we, make sure, we made sure that, that um, the things we do and did in, in the area is, is isolated from the rest of, of uh, of the surrounding agricultural areas. Of course, there are there are the um, uh, the upstream lying areas, but we make sure that uh, the upstream lying areas uh, don't have a negative effect of the water surface uh, wa the surface water uh, level rise uh, in in the area. And in fact, as I, as I showed, um, we have gained buffer capacity of I think fifteen thousand cubic meters, which is a positive effect, in fact, on <coughs> the upstream lying agricultural areas. Mm. Mm. Um, and, a, and a follow on from you, um, for you, um, you've got the buffering area and the storage area. Um, 
why did you choose to use these two approaches and how did you decide where to locate them? Well, just, just because we had to, to maintain the buffer capacity overall over the project. Um, uh, in fact, if, if we would take in some buffer capacity, we had to compensate it. If, if we would just raise the water level to, to the level I showed on one of the slides, we would have to compensate something like 150,000 cubic meters, which is, which is impossible. Mm -hmm. So we had to take into account the uh, different water buffer capacities in different parts of, of the project area. And I showed you that there was one part, that, which is the low-lying part of, of the project area, where <coughs> Uh, we want to optimize uh, buffer capacity yep. and then the part in which the demo of, of Quetzal is located where buffer capacity is lower and where we will, will take some buffer capacity which is compensated by other parts of uh, the project area and that's why we differentiate it over the um, in fact it's the higher lower uh, the higher lying parts of the project area where we ha will have the higher water level in the future right Okay. Can I ask a related question, actually, to Niels? Because uh, I'm fascinated by your both projects in terms of restoring or storing more water in the ground. Uh, presumably, that um, helps avoid having to apply for planning permission to, to, to obviously you have to get an environmental license to do this. But mm -hmm. is it simpler in planning terms to store water underground versus a surface major surface reservoir? And I guess the second question is: Does it have implications for what you can grow on that land? because I've been working for the government on some lowland peat projects, how to, how to manage lowland peat so that it is more sustainable, so it's not releasing greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. And there's a trade-off between the level of the water table and then what you can grow on the surface, because obviously roots don't like to sit in, sit in water. So yeah, does, it, does storing water, uh, you know, aquifer recharge, you know, those, those kind of projects about infiltration, does it affect what you can grow on the surface? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean that's uh, that, that that that's good point. Um, and, and farmers are, are really sensitive on, on, on that aspect. They 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 accept that that you need a groundwater level rise to to, 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 to grow the bell to, to grow the bubble, but they they are very cautious to to have not no damage on the crops for for, for too much water. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's that's a delicate balance, and, and that that's why monitoring is, is important. That you can that you can say. Stop infiltration, and at the moment that is that is not really needed. Mm -hmm. So you can really make customized, uh, say, control systems to 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 inject the water at the moment you yeah. you have the space to do it. Mm. Um, that that's yeah that that's a major concern. And uh, yeah, it's, historically, far, most farmers are more afraid for for uh, damage by too much water than. To last water. Yeah. yeah, because if it rots, you don't have yeah. yields yeah. at all. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's yeah. partly a culture yeah. shift, isn't it? From yeah. um, At the moment, drainage is all about getting the water off, getting the water out and getting yeah. it out yeah. into the sea. And it's about a change in mindset about actually trying to yeah. safeguard it, store it, use yeah. it yeah. for a different, part, different yeah. time of year. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and, and on the permitting question, uh, I have an impression that it, it may be more complex to, to store water underground at this moment because of mm. all the infiltration requirements. Mm. Yep. Then, then, then we'll then definitely get onto that this afternoon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do something above ground. So yeah, that was yeah following off of that that question um, from Tom about um, regulatory issues. But yeah, that's <laughs> it's much more complicated, isn't it? To as um, our, our UK partners will tell us about yeah. how to, um, to to make sure we're putting good water in underground. Um, Mariska, I was really interested in your comments about it's much more expensive to put the water in the ditches rather than out to sea. What drives that increased cost? That's just a tax we have to pay. <laughs> so it's the okay. old system of getting water away, <laughs> so they don't want it. Yeah. So yeah. it's just an old just yeah, just regulation. Okay. Like I said, so it's it to be redesigned. Solve, right? It's easy to solve. <laughs> they want it as well, because we had a discussion with them, of course. Mm -hmm. It's kind of strange, but it takes time maybe yeah, to change it. So I don't know how it's in English. Well, they, um, yes, they've, they've yeah. changed licenses, the costs of abstracting okay. water. It used to be yeah. really cheap and you used to just have yeah. to, it was like an administrative charge. So you could have a really huge license for, for a volume of water and you pay a small amount just for, just for the paperwork. But now they've changed it so that the license charges do reflect the amount of water um, that is part of that license. And that has to be, that has to be a good thing. And so we've got a question from, um, from the continent about um, 
how rainwater is used for irrigation and what percentage of that rainwater is used for irrigation. Mm. Have you got I don't have a figure. I don't figures. have a figure for that uh, actually. I mean, I guess the problem is that we have a huge amount of rain in this country. We have lots of water, but it just it falls at the wrong time of year, and uh, we have a lot. We, people say it's not my phrase. We have plenty of water. We don't have enough water management. And so yeah. within England, we're always jumping over the channel to go and visit the Netherlands, going to visit Belgium, to find out how you do it, and then bringing that expertise back. And uh, as I say, part of it is just say, making better use of the water that does fall, uh, using it as efficiently as possible. Mm. It's really good to see the drip, drip irrigation systems being used for potatoes. I think that has to be part of the answer. Uh, and also, as I say, storing it in the landscape, uh, more storage uh, reservoirs, and at a grander scale, obviously, for the water companies, mm -hmm. potentially getting to desalination as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, we, we have a question about the price that farmers are willing to pay for, um, for water uh, in the three countries. And I think that's probably one to hold over for this afternoon when we're going to, um, we're going to be talking about the, the price um, that's being paid currently in the UK. And we can, um, we can refer back to that one later. So we'll pick that up later. Um, but we've got another one here. The infiltration scheme, does um, the infiltration efficiency degrade with time, mm. either quality or quantity? And if so, how, is, how are measures used to recover that efficiency? Oh, is that a question for, for me? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should have made more right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's probably a question more for, for, for Anna this afternoon, if, if I may. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, yeah, yeah it, 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 I've, not a, I've not a clear answer on this. On this okay, yes. well, let's, let's yeah. hold that over for this yeah. afternoon. We've got plenty of time for, for exploring that further. Um, Edgar, why didn't you turn the lands into an open reservoir? If the intention was to store, what uh, was that due to permitting permitting requirements? Um, uh, well, it's it's an Artura 2000 uh, land area, mm. so we have uh, habitat uh, goals, and um, we will look in the near future how high we can get the water level without uh, interacting negatively with the habitat development. Um, but for now, we've chosen certain levels, maximum levels, to 20, to 30, and we'll see. Um, so it, it's it's because of of, uh, of regulation, but nature regula uh, regulation. Brilliant, thank you, Mariska. We've got one for you um, about the video and the mention of Legionella, um, and that it could be present in the ditches. How how do you do? You have plans to improve that water quality? Now, actually, uh, there's always Legionella in water, eh? uh, but we, in our uh, wastewater system, we also monitor quite high values sometimes. So we have an additional safety building mm -hmm. before it goes to the ditches, because especially if farmers going to spray it, there's a high risk. So we would never do uh, provide our water if it would not be safe. So that's why we uh, Good. did that. So you're yeah. that quality yeah. effectively straight away. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and I think um, the last question that we've got at the moment is um, large investments depend on income, but we might have some wet years and farmers will no longer be interested, bringing business plan um, into danger. How do you deal with this? Mm. It's a question for anybody who yeah. wants to answer it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I think I, I hate may, may address that in the afternoon, but uh, I, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty obvious that, that, that you cannot make plans like yeah, like some may want to do for, for the next two or three years. I mean, you really need an approach which takes 20 years mm. and make a, make a kind of agreement on how to collaborate, mm -hmm. um, how to be flexible in, 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 in using water in, and in, in, say maybe have, an, have, a, have a staged price for, for certain portions you want to use. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of different collaboration models and, uh -huh. and, and, and uh, Ideas how to how to solve that, uh, but it, it 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 has to do with operating costs, with investment costs, with priorities between between the users, and, and yeah, that's that's something we have to we have to we have to yeah. still collaborate. And there are a few examples in, in especially in Belgium where they where they made that successful. It's critical we've got to find yeah. a new business model yeah. to make this yeah. work, haven't yeah. we? Yeah. Yeah. To, to, to value and, that. and not be sensitive for 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 the one year which which is bad. Yeah. And also yeah. the awareness there, eh? I yeah. think it's very important because we see also in our area that the younger farmers are much more into making uh, buffers mm. than 
Yeah, the ones who yeah. just get into bed. So it's the old men that are the problem, is it? <laughs> no, no, as usual. maybe, yeah. <laughs> no. Speaking as one. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm just, just on that, I, th I think no. uh, I, my sense is there's very little complacency now that out, out there amongst farmers about where their water might come from. Probably they haven't quite grasped some of the, the scale of the challenge coming down the track, um, but they know that climate change is already affecting weather patterns. They know that the you know, rainfall has changed, it's falling in heavier bursts, it's not falling for months, and months on end. And you know, droughts used to be kind of like a one in a seven year event, but now they seem to be kind of stacking up to a greater or yeah. lesser mm -hmm. extent. So, no, I, yeah, I think there is, there is an audience out there who wants to know where their water is coming from, and they're, you know, there's, they're not going to be complacent yeah. uh, now or in the future, I'm pretty sure of that. Excellent. I think that's a great um, look forward to what we've got to uh, talk about this afternoon. We're going to be looking, um, talk, looking at projects that, where we've got some of those forward-looking farmers mm. um, who, have, who have put some work into action that's securing those water resources that they're going to need in the future. So yeah. it's a, a great segue. Thank you. Um, I think we'll draw that the, this morning's session to a close now. Um, it's a slightly early lunch for, for the UK, but um, I never <laughs> complain about that. Um, so we'll be, um, we'll be coming back um, one o'clock UK, UK time, um, two o'clock in, uh, in the continent. Um, and we'll look forward to uh, seeing, having another um, uh, keynote speaker, Anne from Del Taras, and, um, and then three more demonstration projects to, uh, to hear from. So I look forward to welcoming you back after lunch. Thank you very much. Lunch. Um, on to the afternoon session now. Um, and we're going to begin that with um, our second keynote speaker, um, Anne from uh, Del Taris, who's got international experience in, in looking at um, how we can store water in very interesting ways. So over to Anne. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, welcome back. Uh, it's my honor to talk you through your uh, lunch, after lunch dip. Um, I will be talking about managed aquifer recharge, and, um, yeah, I, and my, the title of my talk is Managed Aquifer Recharge as the Solution of uh, to Fresh Water Stochastity. Um, yeah, my name is Anne Wiersma. I work for Deltares. Deltares is an independent institute. Uh, of, uh, for water and subsurface uh, research institute, and uh, we look at many delta solutions, uh, solutions to keep deltas livable. Um, so we also worked on a lot of managed aquifer recharge solutions. Um, yeah, I will show some history of managed aquifer recharge in Europe. I will go through uh, managed aquifer recharge schemes on different scales and also manage aquifer recharge at different uh, technology levels. So I would like to start with a, an infographic that my colleagues made, um, and it's about salinization um, of the land in time. And so we start in the past, in the past everything was in balance. Um, when we were just first settlers, first farmers, we were living in, in the high parts of the land, and we were, um, we were growing what could grow somewhere. Um, everything was in a dynamic equilibrium. And from a groundwater perspective, on your top right, you can see the groundwater balance. Um, the groundwater balance is your recharge comes out as a discharge. So that means that all the water that infiltrates in your soil uh, recharges your groundwater and uh, in the end, it, it comes out as discharge. Uh, and what's important about that is your groundwater is not just waiting there to be sucked up. Um, it's, it's always a dynamic process. And if you take groundwater out, it means that less water is discharged. So the present situation, of course, every square meter of the land is, is in use. And we made a, 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 in incredible progress, fantastic water management practices. So we made this happen. Um, but as we know, um, yeah, we, we are discharging, uh, we are actually taking a lot of groundwater out. And in the present, our 
change in storage. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and if you take out groundwater through wells, you are doing three things. You're changing uh, storage, you're changing discharge, or you're changing uh, recharge. In this case, we're um, in this present situation, we're changing storage. In other words, groundwater levels go down and that changes discharge. In other words, less water is seeping out to the uh, service water system. In the future, because we love to extrapolate things to some kind of dystopian futures, if we continue this way, then um, we're still discharging, but that discharge that ends up as less, uh, uh, there's no more change in storage, but there's change in discharge. Less water is seeping out still in the surface water system, and there's a change in recharge. In other words, in the end, water is sucked in from your surface water system into your groundwater system, and that has many implications, uh, water quality, etc. Luckily, we can adapt to the situation. We have adapted to the situation in the past, and we will adapt to the situation uh, in the future. And that's why uh, we have these fantastic initiatives like uh, Fresh for Seas, because we have to test new solutions. And there are many solutions available. Um, solutions that there are, of course, are on the water demand side. You can think about water pricing, because that's the only incentive that, that really works for us. If we have to pay for it, we will use less. Uh, wastewater water reusage, we have seen some nice examples of that. Uh, coastal protection, so keep out the coast, so you can keep the, the salt water out in this case. Um, less water usage, clearly, so uh, don't flush your toilet with uh, beautiful drinking water, but perhaps from, from captured water. Uh, less spillage and a change in crops. So use of salt resistant crops or just change your crops to a, a less water intensive crop. And then on the supply side, you can think about desalinization, new desalinization technologies. Uh, you can think about brackish water as a fresh water source. And my colleagues always say brackish is the new fresh. Uh, you can think about rainwater harvesting. You can think about increasing the sponge, uh, the, 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 the sponge characteristics of the landscape, so just keeping more water. And managed aquifer recharge is often used, is often mentioned as a, as a great solution. Um, so in the future, the ideal situation would be less discharge from wells, because we have done things on the demand side, and um, we increase the recharge to the groundwater system by using managed aquifer recharge. That would be the ideal situation. So, managed aquifer recharge, well, the official, uh, the, the official uh, definition is the purposeful recharge of water to aquifers for subsequent recovery or environmental benefit. And actually, it's, it's an umbrella term for all of the solutions that you see on the right-hand side. Um, and uh, yeah, it has many advantages. It has a, a small surface footprint, so you don't need a large reservoir at the surface. Uh, there's no evaporation and um, natural, <coughs> there's a natural treatment capacity because the, the water filtrates uh, the, the soil filtrates the water. But there's also a huge need uh, for groundwater, uh, for groundwater recharge, because there's a huge overextraction. And to point out how huge that extraction is, at, at present, the sea level rise is about four uh, millimeters per year. Of that four millimeters per year, one millimeter per year is actually uh, caused by groundwater over extraction. So groundwater is taken out of storage, is used to irrigate plants, that comes back in a fast hydrological system, flushes to the sea, and so 25% of, of the current sea level rise is caused by groundwater uh, over extraction. 
So there's quite a need to replenish groundwater. Um, then I want to start with a, a bit of history uh, of managed aquifer reed yards, in this case in Europe. And actually, perhaps not everybody knows, but we're actually, the UK is the birth ground of managed aquifer recharge. Because the first managed aquifer recharge um, installation was um, in Glasgow. It was installed in 1810, and it was uh, a horizontal uh, uh, perforated pipe, collector pipe, uh, along the river, in the riverbed and that was used to extract the water. So you can imagine that in the 1800s in England it was not uh, the cleanest river water, so this was a solution to make it drinkable. And that was a great success, the Glasgow case, so it, uh, many, many cities followed. And by 1860 this, uh, this success moved to uh, the rest of Europe, and so many countries followed. Um, and uh, except for riverbank filtration, which actually doesn't increase the storage capacity of groundwater. Um, also, after a while, spreading methods came around, and that does increase the storage capacity. Um, however, um, if, if you look at the lower right graph, yeah, you can see from uh, 1870 to 2000, the amount of managed aquifer recharge installations uh, installed in Europe um, and you can see that there's a, uh, quite an increase in the 1960s. Um, but also with the 1960s, if when uh, also well injection starts to happen, uh, there are also many, um, many failures actually. So many failures of managed aquifer recharge. And that's, the cause of that is, um, is, is clogging. It's mechanical clogging because uh, turbid water is injected um, or turbid water uh, clogs the, 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 the bed of your infiltration basins uh, or chemical clogging because if you start mixing different kinds of water you can, uh, you can get mineral, minerals forming and um, also biological clogging happens so you can get a, a, a bacterial film on your filter screens. Um, in 2013, there were uh, about, in Europe, 224 installations. Most of them were in Germany. Also, most of them were riverbed uh, filtration systems. And that is striking, because in, that means that in, in just over 200 years, um, just over 200 installations have been surviving, uh, came to life. So actually, it's, it's, it's not very big yet. Um, and now I would like to take you to uh, Amsterdam, where I'm from, um, where, in, uh, where one of uh, the Netherlands' first managed aquifer recharge installation is, uh, uh, happened. And the story is that, that Amsterdam, of course, is a growing city, needed a lot of water. And before the 1850s, it, was, it came from the, the rivers close by that were still a little bit clean. But actually, it was almost undrinkable. And when people found out that actually under the dunes, there's a huge freshwater reservoir, uh, people started to build the first pipeline uh, to the, uh, yeah, from the dunes to Amsterdam to supply the water to the city. It was actually very good water. And so on the right hand side you see a cross section of the Netherlands with that freshwater lens. And probably you know the principle, the, the Badon Geiben Herzberg principle, where if you have, uh, well actually just where fresh water floats on salt water and all the, the part of the freshwater lens that's above your reference level is below that there's 40 times as much fresh water. So in other words, if you increase your groundwater level by 10 centimeters, you get four meters of water back down your reference level. And you can play with that. Um, yeah, so there was the pipeline 
from the dunes to Amsterdam, uh, but of course the city kept growing, water demand kept increasing, and the, 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 the fresh water lens was shrinking, and there were many, many issues with water quality, salinization, and therefore in the 1950s, actually infiltration ponds were installed in the dunes. These are the infiltration ponds, and uh, rainwater from really far away, about 70 kilometers away, is pumped up to the dunes, and uh, yeah, it, it, it infiltrates in the dunes and to reverse the depletion. Um, before that, there, there's pretreatment, but in this case, the dunes are also used as a treatment, as an extra filtration, and. Well, this creates a buffer for drought uh, as, as well and calamities because if your river, for instance, is polluted, you cannot take in water and you still have your huge reservoir below your dunes. Um, yeah, but now it's uh, 2023. Uh, Amsterdam is still growing. Water demand is growing. We need to shower. We need to fill our ponds and our... Um, and our swimming pools. So, yeah, it's actually time for new measures. And so I just told you about the challenges. So this is again a cross section of the, the waterleiding down. This, this comes from an artist called Marco van Meulen. Uh, blue is uh, the fresh water lens, uh, below with the red colors are salt water, and intermediate colors are brackish water. Well, because of sea level rise, of course, your, that, that pushes up your freshwater lens. So your freshwater lens is shrinking, and um, which, which is a problem. Demand is growing. So what kind of solution can you think of? I would call it a managed aquifer recharge 2.0 because they are very highly technical, technological things. It's, you can increase the dunes. So expand the dunes towards the sea, so to, to grow them uh, in width, but also in height. Uh, you can play around with, uh, with collector wells close to the sea. So you are actually <coughs> lowering the pressure near the sea. You're taking out salt water and you're increasing the lens to that side. You can think of, uh, of, 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 of extracting brackish water again, so you again reduce the pressure below your freshwater lens, and your freshwater lens grows down. Uh, yeah, but these are quite high-tech solutions. Except for, of course, the expansion of the dunes, but it, it does take some, uh, it, it, it's quite costly. Um, another uh, case which is more local is the creek ridge infiltration systems that we've heard a lot about uh, today already. A creek ridge infiltration is you use the higher parts in the landscape uh, that often already have a freshwater lens uh, to actually, again, grow this freshwater lens uh, by pumping up water during the wet season and taking it out, extracting it in horizontal drains um, in, in the dry season for irrigation. So this is the, the Braakman creek, creek ridge again. Where Niels already told a lot about. You can see the red colors on the left hand side is the DEM of the area. Dark colors, the dark brown colors are the higher areas. Um, and so that's the creek ridge. On the right hand side, you see a map of the 1900s uh, where you see that actually there was a tidal channel here and it was only closed off at, at 1952. And that creates this elevated part in the landscape. This is exactly where the, uh, where, where the Teneuse, the Dow pilot is. And if you look at the freshwater lens thickness, indeed, below the creek ridge, it's a lot thicker. The blue colors are above 15 or 20 meters uh, thick. So that's, uh, yeah, you, you, can, you can see the effect back and you can use it. But yeah, a, a creek ridge, it sounds really... Uh, really tough, but, but this is an example of the creek ridge. We are doing measurements here. Uh, we are testing if, if the freshwater lens has, has grown during the season. So we are lowering a well logging tool. Um, and yeah, if you 
would lie on your belly, you could perhaps see some elevated parts, but yeah, it is still, if you're there, it's pretty flat. Don't expect too much of it. So, yeah, Niels already mentioned that we are, it's too early to have results yet of the, uh, of, of the Dow case, because we've only measured in one winter, and it was also, also an exceptionally dry winter, so we were actually infiltrating water, but uh, probably we were infiltrating the water that would actually, that would in a natural winter uh, have infiltrated, so uh, we cannot say too much about it yet. But there are experiences from other um, creek ridge infiltration uh, experiments, and this one is from Seroskerke, and on the left hand side you can see measurements with that well logging tool where we test to see if the freshwater lens is growing. And the, 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 probably you cannot see, you cannot see the, the, the years, but trust me, uh, the, the highest one is the oldest one, and you can see it growing through the years. So it grows, I think, in five years, two and a half meters. So uh, it can work. On the right-hand side, you see uh, electrical measurements where there's also... Uh, where we monitor, monitor the growth of the lens. And also there, you can actually see it growing over time. So it can, uh, it can work. But then the question is, that creek ridge infiltration, yeah, how many creeks are there? Or where can you apply it? And for that, you can create suitability maps. In this case, so if, if you look at the, the province of Zeeland in the Netherlands, um, If you look at the surface elevation, so what you need for creek ridge infiltration is a higher, slightly higher surface elevation. In this case, um, you, can, you can see in the red colors the higher elevated areas, which are indeed often creek ridges. You can also see the dunes in the top uh, along the sea, and you can see higher areas in the, on the right hand side. But really in Zeeland, the, the elevated parts are creek ridges and the blue parts are actually the old land, the old islands that uh, have been reclaimed and, and sunk below sea level. Um, and yeah, what, what you would like to see is that a fresh water lens has actually already developed because that also suggests that it, there's actually quite a potential for creek ridge infiltration. Uh, this map shows uh, the thickness of the freshwater lens that was uh, actually estimated by flying with a helicopter with an EM, an electromagnetic instrument, below it. And so for the whole province of Zeeland, we have, looked, uh, we have mapped out all the freshwater um, resources. And there you can also see that below those creek ridges, there's a much thicker freshwater lens, and you can also see a very thick freshwater lens in blue colors below the dunes. So that way, if you look at well, the surface elevation, um, the, the presence of a freshwater lens, uh, you can also add some other um, important parameters for, for creek ridge infiltration. In this case, you can look, is there sand below the uh, freshwater lens, because if there's clay below the freshwater lens, it won't grow further. Um, also, the, the, the soil, it, it shouldn't be too permeable, because if it would be gravel, you wouldn't be creating a lens at all. Uh, if it would be clay, uh, it's impossible to get water into the ground. So, we've also looked at the, the soil types. Um, you need space above the groundwater table, because otherwise your lens uh, yeah, your lens also cannot grow, and um, of course, there needs to be it needs to be water available for infiltration. Well, using those parameters, we've made this map, this suitability map. Green is very suitable, uh, red is not suitable. So, creek ridge infiltration is possible in certain situations according to this map, but of course, you have to look more local if it's really feasible. Um, so does that mean that nothing is possible in the rest of this province? If, if you look at managed aquifer recharge, no, because there are always solutions possible to increase your freshwater availability. In this case, this, this uh, is a case 
uh, comes from the uh, from the GoFresh uh, project, where we looked at um, controllable drains that we put deeper in the ground than drains are usually put into ground, uh, and that way. So at, at present, all the water is uh, drained in the wet season and in the in the dry season immediately, and only a small fresh water lens is forming. But if you put those drains deeper, then you're also uh, and, and you make it controllable, then you can make your thin fresh water lens grow, and you are more resilient for the dry season because you have more fresh water, and you're pushing down the the salt water. And of course. This is quite a small-scale measure. It doesn't mean that you can grow rice in uh, in these uh, in these areas, but uh, all the bits, all the little bits help. Um, yeah, and and also for this kind of solutions, you can make suitability maps. In this case, it shouldn't be too peaty or clayey. Uh, it should be an area with seepage, not infiltration. Um, and there should be a thin freshwater lens. If the freshwater lens is too thick, there's no, no need to do it actually. And so then you get a new suitability map and here also in the green areas, it's very suitable for this technique. In the red areas, it's not. So all the different techniques have their own areas and some can yield more freshwater, others less. And then we look at other um, at, at, at other potential solutions, my colleagues are looking at this um, high, higher elevated area in the Netherlands. It's, it's an ice push ridge, it's pretty sandy, and they see similarities with a, with a, with a watering can. Um, so the idea is what would happen if we would pump up water from the river Isol, uh, actually 300 billion liters uh, per year, and, uh, and recharge it in this beautiful nature reserve area, what would happen? Do we have, can we create an extra freshwater storage? Um, this is, uh, it's, it's, it's still being investigated because it, of course it has huge effects on, on, the, on the nature reserve area of the kind of seepage water that you get and the water quality uh, because there's also a seepage dependent nature along the sides of this nature reserve area. But we're looking at many, many potential areas and many potential solutions. Lastly, and these are all, what I've shown is many different uh, managed aquifer recharge measures. Uh, some of them are very local, some of them are very, uh, are more regional, um, but they're also very Oh yeah, and some of them are really high tech, some of them are really low tech. Well, this is an example of really low tech solutions that actually uh, work very well. Uh, just maintain the sponge or, or recreate the sponge uh, char characteristics of the landscape. So it's just keeping the water in by putting weirs in, in ditches, um, making wetlands. Uh, on, on the top right you see a, a, a Dutch um, firm, it's called Just Dig It, and that's exactly what they do. They just dig holes in Africa uh, that can retain the water and uh, you get greening from it. And of course, the bottom right, just cut up your, your rain pipe so you can uh, infiltrate the rainwater from your roof into your garden. It's the small measures that also count. So to conclude, um, yeah, of course, there is increasing pressure on the water system, groundwater system, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, and managed aquifer recharge can be a partial solution. And that's, that's actually the main message. It's the, 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 what we've seen is we have seen many, uh, many small pilot size projects. Uh, if, if you look at the total amount of um, manage aquifer recharge installations, it's, there's, it's still in the pilot phase. There are not many, um, many projects that actually work, like the water lighting down is a very nice example that does work. But it's still in, in, in uh, it, it hasn't been developed out, let's put it that way. Um, so, yeah, so, but, but for very specific local challenges, it, it can be a very good solution, that's for sure. 
Um, there are high-tech options available, um, small-scale, large-scale options available, um, showing the, the low-tech options, and, but we still have a long way to go to, um, to be significant in, in the global groundwater depletion. And that's also coming back to that one, meter, one millimeter of sea level rise per year. Um, and that's mainly costs, uh, that, that's mainly happening in countries like, like India, China, and, and the US. Um, to get that water back into the ground on short time scales, that's uh, merely impossible. But that was my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. That's um, fascinating. I didn't realise we'd been doing it for quite such a long time. But... Glasgow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who knew? Um, we've got time, a very brief amount of time, so I'm not going to be probably able to get through all of the questions that people have asked, but we can save those. We've got a further Q&A later on that uh, Annie will be involved in. Um, so what is the pretreatment for the Amsterdam dunes infiltration? Does it remove emerging pollutants like PFAS? I have no clue. <laughs> I, I, I doubt it, actually. Oh, well, somebody wins a prize for asking the most difficult question. Yeah, there, exactly. So. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, what is the growth rate of the freshwater lens, Abraham asks? I'm not quite sure which um, section that... Me, me too, but, but, to but the one in um, the, the Creek Ridge infiltration yeah. one is a half a metre per year, I think. Okay. On average, yeah. Uh, Half a metre per year, yeah. Um, and why is it better to create mar in areas with seepage compared to areas with infiltration? Sponge landscapes are needed everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that specific example was for the, for, for, the, for the drains, so for the controllable drains. And there you need seepage, otherwise um, if there is infiltration, probably you already have a, Fresh water lens, actually. Okay. So this is to drain out the salt water that's moving up. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, we Thanks. Can... Thank you. Cheers. So we're now um, starting the final th of the uh, final three um, demo sites. Um, Emmanuel, do you want to Thank take you. Over? Thank you. Um, I'm from Belgium, and my company where I work for is here. We're, we have two small companies in Flanders, and the other ones are bigger ones. So we're situated at the west coast of Flanders. You see, this is Aquadain, and here is Ipswich. So we have been uh, combining water reuse to MAR since 2002. So we have a dune area. It's comparable to Amsterdam, but a little bit smaller, as you see. So we have our infiltration pond here, it's like this, it's about, uh, we have increased it, uh, the capacity recently, uh, but we operate it since 2002 and we use the effluent from the local water reuse plant, uh, sewage plant as the source. This is the scheme, so we take in the effluent, we buffer it, we do ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, and then it's pumped into the dunes. So we have chosen the multiple barrier concepts. So it means that we, are, we make no concessions to quality uh, anyway. Um, but of course, when you say membranes, you have two issues. And the issues are uh, concentrate or backwash water. The backwash water from the ultrafiltration, we treat it with sand filtration. And the filtrate goes back to the buffer. The RO concentrate uh, so far is going to the canal, oh, was going to the canal, because that's what I will talk about today. So what we did since the beginning is that we looked for solutions to treat this concentrate. This concentrate uh, contains all of your um, stuff that you get out of the water. So the biggest issue, of course, are nutrients. We tried with a conventional wetland, but it didn't prove to be sustainable for treating uh, concentrate because it couldn't stand the salinity of the water. And then we tried, um, we were looking for another uh, plant and we were, uh, we st were stuck with willows. And then we started uh, to do box tests with 
10 different species to see what uh, species was the best for the salinity. And uh, we selected some of them and we started the pilot in 2011 and we had it operational for five years. So this is how it works. We put in the influent on one side, we extract it on the other side, the same like a, like a reed bed. Um, it's about 70 meters of gravel and uh, we extract uh, the nitrogen basically by bacteriological activity of the root, at roots. That's what we uh, saw in this demoware project, which was also funded by Europe. And these are the results uh, uh, over the years. So we saw an increase of nitrogen removal over the years, and it's probably because the root system at the willows was, ever, was growing everywhere, every year, and as its work, as its domain uh, um, activity is by bacteria, we have more bacteria, so more nitrogen removal, which is logical. We also had a good uh, phosphorus, phosphorus removal and zinc removal. Uh, COD was removed not too, too well. That's, uh, that's uh, because all of the COD going through sewage plant is more like uh, not uh, biodegradable, so that's logic that we can't remove it too much uh, with a, a natural system. So, based on this experience, we wanted to build up for a full scale, and then we got the opportunity to uh, enter into the Fresh for Seeds project, and we decided to go for the full scale. So, we obtained uh, a piece of land nearby the Torella treatment plant, and um, we started building. Well, the biggest issue, of course, was like always getting your permit. But finally, we got a permit and we started constructing the wetland or the, 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 the willow uh, marsh in uh, uh, 2021. And we became operational at the end of 2021 with the first test and fully operational beginning 2022. This is the build up. So this is the, the plan. On one side, we enter the, the RO concentrate and we discharge it or collect it uh, after the willow marsh with drains on the other side. So the, the flow is from the south to the north. And it's about uh, 40 meters wide here and 20 meters that side. So after uh, we made, we used uh, the sand we removed to build up the ditches so we didn't remove any sand from the area. Then we put an impermeable layer because we, want, we don't want that this uh, contaminated uh, concentrate would go into the aquifer, the local aquifer. So we, this is the impermeable layer. Then on top of this layer we put the gravel. On one side we have the canal to uh, to put the concentrate into the field and we have some coarser gravel on, uh, uh, by the canal. We also used in a small part some, um, some wood chips instead of gravel because uh, experiences in California uh, told us that they were better for removal of uh, nitrogen. So that this is an experiment within this project. Then, uh, yeah, this is the the canal for the RO concentrate, so it, you see it's over the whole length of the willow marsh. And then the willow stools are planted into the willow marsh. Uh, they are in, uh, in rows and every stool is at 50 centimeters from each other and the rows are 70 meters from each other. So that's the build-up. So this is the, the picture with all the stools that are planted. Um, and we, we gather, we gather the, the effluent from the willow marsh into a, a buffer reservoir and pump it back into the canal, but now treat it. I will show you about some results, but of course we're only one year operational, so uh, it's what it is, but it's, we, we have to, to wait for two, three years to have a a good uh, overview of the uh, quality. So what we did is that we take a sample, a day sample at day one from the influence of the willow marsh and we take a sample 
the day after, also on 40 uh, hours base from the effluent. And you can see the, that the relation is, is quite good. So it means that the average uh, residence time of the concentrate in the Duilo Marsh is about one day. Just as in the DemoWare project, we have all, always consistent removal of nitrogen. So even in the, in the summer, it was even up to 40%, which is very good for the first years. For the phosphorus, overall, we had an average removal, but there were some, some uh, sometimes it was increasing. So we, we don't know why, but we saw the same in, in demo where we have to, we will have to look in the next years why it is. But overall, the average, on average uh, basis, we have a removal also for phosphorus. Uh, as already told, chemical and oxy uh, oxygen demand on, uh, is, is, is quite low in removal, but still we have some average removal. Uh, biological oxygen demand is always removed uh, or mostly removed all the time. Um, we took zinc as a, an example for metals because we don't have a lot of metals into, the, into our reference, so we use zinc. Uh, zinc is removed while well, it was the same like in the demoware uh, project. It was not uh, consistent like nitrogen, but most of the time we had some removal. And also we took, a, because we have to measure AOX for the, for the permit, and we also measured that into the in and effluent of the Willow Marsh, and we saw, uh, while well, the removal here was almost always consistent and very good. So uh, it means that for those uh, uh, compounds of concern, we have some, uh, some removal rate. So la uh, last year, in the first year of operation, we, uh, we have put 85% of the concentrate that we produce over the Willow Marsh. So this is a, already a good result and we have seen uh, positive removal uh, rates already. Um, we had an issue with the hydraulic capacity of the Willow Marsh. Um, so uh, uh, in summer when we have a, a, a greater uh, production, we couldn't remove it um, efficiently. So we will have to double the drain at this site and uh, the excavation pipe will be doubled here so that we have uh, good removal uh, of the effluent uh, this summer, next summer. We will do it uh, next week, starting next week. We, uh, we got an award for this, uh, um, this concept, this Euro Marsh, uh, last uh, year from the Flemish uh, authorities. And uh, conclusions and some uh, yeah, things about uh, remarks for, for other projects. This is for us a first step in further treatment of the concentrate because after the willows we want to test uh, new treatments so that we can put this uh, back into the, to, to the, to the RO so that we would, would be able to increase the capacity and the efficiency of Torela. Now we have a 70% efficiency uh, both with UF and RO. And if we can treat this uh, effluent, we want to go for 80-85% in the near future. Of course, the system can be used uh, everywhere on every scale. You can, you can use it uh, also at factories. And you can uh, use it for green buffers. Of course, the willows will also be um, harvesters because this system is like a combination of a, of a constructed wetland and short rotation coppice. We will, we will cut the, the, the willows every three to four years. The first idea was to use them for heating or for a soil improvement, but we've also noticed that the same kinds of willows were used for making chairs and, uh, and baskets up to the 50s. So maybe uh, within 10, 20 years, when you come to our coast, you will, you will sit in those chairs in the restaurants or in the bars. That's it. Thank you, Emmanuel. That's brilliant. Um, handing over to the first of the UK demonstration projects now, John Patrick from Felix Hydrocycle. Hydro Cycle. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm John Patrick, and I was first approached uh, four years ago by a, um, a group of diverse um, water stakeholders who had been working on some quite, um, 
what's the word, futuristic thinking around the challenges that water stakeholders on, along the Suffolk coast were facing. Um, but they got to a point where um, they'd been working on it for six years at that stage and very sensibly had engaged all stakeholders, softened the ground, but it got to a point that it needed to get some commercial traction. And at that point, um, funded by six farmers initially, um, we formed a company called Felix So Hydro Cycle. And um, what I'm going to run through uh, half of it now is the one of the very logical ideas that they'd come up with, which was why are we um, paying as um, taxpayers to pump fresh water through a drainage system into the, into the North Sea when there were water stakeholders short of water inland? And then the second project, which Paul, who has also been engaged within the company, um, if going forward, the water that is available for um, agricultural abstraction is predominantly going to be available in the winter because there's no groundwater left, summer water very sensitive off rivers, then um, how are we going to store it? And rather than building above ground expensive reservoirs, we thought logically we're in trouble for abstract, over abstracting the groundwater. There must be plenty of water down, uh, plenty of space downstairs to put the water. So why build above ground reservoirs? So those are the two very um, logical elements to the business that is Felix Stowe Hydro Cycle. Um, and this is just a, a quick um, overview of, of how historic agriculture abstraction has happened in this area. Um, so we're, we're irrigating harder over the last 30, 40 years. Um, initially, the easy option was to put a borehole into the aquifer, suck it up, pump it straight onto the field in the summer. Um, or put a pump in a river, pump it straight onto the field. Easy, cheap, and was regulated comfortably initially. But as um, it became apparent that that behaviour was starting to have impacts on groundwater, combined with our understanding now that um, summer rainfall was going to reduce with climate change understandings. Uh, it's two things come from that. Not only do we get less summer in, uh, water in the summer, we get more in the winter. So we get more runoff, but no significant change in recharge. So surprise, surprise, these combined behaviours with a change in the climate means that we've got a problem. And a, a lot of what I think agriculture and actually all of us in society today have to understand our historic behaviours need to change and change very significantly. Which, um, apologies, Daniel. Uh, there's a bit of duplication now going to go on um, from some of Daniel's slides, but this is just confirming um, the change in water profile that will be presented to, to um, the challenge of um, sustainable water going forward. Um, so yeah, one of Daniel's slides, uh, as we said, a very dry region of the country, a lot of demands, um, and I just rather than double up too much, if you look at the, the, the size of the challenge uh, to be sustainable for 2050, um, I think the big change is we all have got, whichever stakeholder you're coming from, we've all got increased demand, but this recognition of the needs of the environment is very significant and that's what's going to drive a lot of the behaviour change. Um, again, a projection from WRE, uh, where will this extra water come from? Quite a scary figure for me is the proportion of desalination will be of that. And these new reservoirs are big um, multi-use transfer reservoir schemes. They're not based at small farm level. Massive investment required for this. Um, my concern with these um, options is that the, the, they, a lot of work onto it. I really welcome what it will bring. A lot of this won't make a difference to our region for another 12 to 15 years because of the scale of the investment. 
or beyond, uh, and the cost of this would be outside the reach of agriculture. It's probably 10 times the cost of what we're supplying water through Felix So High Cycle. Um, and if you give agriculture the challenges it's going to face in the next five years, uh, we'll be dead in, not dead in the water, but this will come too late to save agriculture. These are the challenges that um, more locally, oh sorry, nationally, but particularly locally, um, agriculture is uh, impacted by. Um, and there's a, an ongoing timetable here. The very significant one is when Environment Act and the move to permits comes in place and the change from water law to environmental law and the powers that brings. Um, the change is that uh, we're seeing the agency is struggling to make at the moment will be a lot easier to implement with the change with the Environment Act. This is a, another example of um, uh, of how we're trying to communicate these threats to uh, the abstractors. And uh, three years ago, I worked closely with Harry Condy and Matt Ramskar at the Environment Agency to come up with a, a heat map, as we called it, to try and make people aware of where that risk was going to land. These have now been um, this heat map two uh, to show. And it, just as an example, 93% of the groundwater in that upper catchment would have to be removed to bring the river status back to the targets that are in place. These, these are eventually getting farmers to take the head out of the sand and react to the threat to their business and encourage them to change their behaviour. I don't say that critically, um, but it is becoming urgent and the time, time frame is over the next three to four years. I'm very mindful there's a lot of negativity around uh, the impacts on farmers. There's a lot of red on maps. And so part of the Felix de Hyde cycle was trying to demonstrate to farmers there is hope. It's not all red, it's what we call, if you've got heat maps, we've got cool maps. And the cool maps are the, the two things that we've tried to demonstrate within Felix de Hyde cycle. Um, some of the other things in the changing that behavior is, you know, show people there is another way get some, some speed and adaptability and, and real collaboration between the policy makers. Um, get everybody to understand this is a long game. Uh, getting a reservoir that you can fill for six years or when you've got a 25 year payback isn't that attractive to the people making the investment. And um, agriculture, the two gentlemen at the top formed SWAG, which is a water tractor group, we need to get agriculture collectively behaving as professionally as public water supply. So that's all about the, um, the, the motivation that has been around to do something different. And now I'm just going to explain quickly the, um, the simple bit of Felix Tohide cycle, which is putting a pump house on the seawall here where currently the IDB have been pumping water out into the estuary. Well, we've put a new pump house there, put a pipe down in all the way back practically to Ipswich um, and to top up reservoirs that are going to become challenged in their supply as their groundwater licenses disappear. Uh, one of the things that helped this, and I think it's a good point of people looking at, at trying to repeat this, um, a wonderful lady called Jane Birch, who used to be in, in Matt's team at Suffolk Council, um, had the foresight to get all the stakeholders in the room and understand the impacts of this scheme would have on, on their interests. I think the first meeting had something like 23 different stakeholders, and when it came down to doing the business, it was down to six. But at least everyone had a chance. And in that, uh, it was identified that the current sorry, the existing behaviour of pumping high volumes of drainage water at sea was actually damaging a very valuable salt marsh. Salt marsh fixes as much carbon per hectare as a, a hectare of um, Amazon rainforest. And it's, it's very scarce um, throughout Europe. So 
that allowed, and this is a lesson for copycat schemes, get those people with you and it actually smooths the way. It doesn't, it doesn't allow the rules to be broken, but it gets everybody um, in, going in the same direction. Um, and then uh, how, how, what does the model look like? Six farmers and um, their share in the business ranges from 2 to 34%, so it, it fits big and small. All put some loan capital in. We formed a limited company, um, and thankfully, through the support of Fresh Four Seas, we, we found the rest of the capital to get this scheme up and running. Um, the budget for this was 20 pence a cube, uh, and for that, uh, the farmers pay that annually on whatever volume they take and um, that would pay the running costs of the business and repay their loans that they put to the business in a 14-year period. We've unfortunately, even though um, our wonderful contractors are here somewhere, built this on time and on budget in a COVID year and we had held 20 pence a cube, we, we just had to up that to 23 pence a cube reflecting the energy increases. As a, an, a, an interesting reference, we have um, the early stages of a copycat scheme on the other side of the estuary, and the budget pricing for that has gone up to 40 pence. So in two and a half years, the inflation has nearly doubled um, the cost of a, a very similar scheme. Um, this is the kind of uh, boring bit probably for people because it's pretty standard. The whole country knows how to put a pipeline in the ground, pump water, but, but for those that you're interested, that's the detail. Um, we've, we've found a couple of I'll just, uh, innovative eel screens um, that we came from America. Um, I was a bit worried that they might not stand up to freezing conditions, and an American guy who got one of these uh, said, ring me back in half an hour, I'll be standing on the ice next to the machine to demonstrate to you that they, they will tolerate operating in freezing conditions. So uh, they've stood up well. Uh, they then supply a pretty standard set of pumps um, that boost the water up um, a 14 kilometer pipeline, um, two pipes uh, that give us flexibility through the year to move water up and down um, and the capacity to fill it says nine different reservoirs, but we've got two more being built this year, so it'll be a total of 11 different reservoirs. Um, that's a quick summary on the, on the kind of technical stuff. It's not, as I say, that challenging in terms of um, the understanding and the repeating, um, but I think reflecting on the key uh, challenges that we had and the things that if you want to do this, you, you probably need to do really well. The collaboration piece, getting everybody to work together and uh, our Suffolk, our UK partners, having the council on board, having the, the, the science from uh, UEA and the support from the regulator with the environment agency is absolutely fundamental. Um, the ground softening that went on with Jane Birch and her team of people looking at um, uh, where were the hurdles, where were the barriers? That, uh, I, I don't think it needs to be seven years if we do another one of these, but that was crucial in allowing us to deliver this in a, a relatively short three-year period. Um, and I think the other thing is getting all of those stakeholders to be aligned and informed as you go through the process, because there are changes along the way. Um, we have pumped now 1.1 million approximately through the system. It is robust. It is priced at an agricultural value. So, I mean, this pipeline element of the scheme was, was built for about a million. Um, we were getting quotes in um, 27 quotes, the highest of which was 13 million. So some of these schemes you can get scared off, but I think if, if you can do it in a professional agricultural way, which we did, they are viable. Uh, I think the one thing I wish I could start again and do better is the whole legal process of putting pipelines across land. Um, it is fraught, even without 
the land registry going on holiday for two years during COVID. Um, uh, just give yourself plenty of time. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Paul and Jonathan, who will fill you in on the second very logical but quite sophisticated part of Felix the High Cycle. Thanks, John. Um, when you say logical and sophisticated, I'm not... <laughs> well, can't claim to be that. Um, my name's Paul Bradford. Um, I'm the project manager for the Managed Act for Recharge part of the scheme. Um, and when I say project manager, it's more like um, regulation wrangler, I think. Um, I think what we've got to remember, to put this thing into context, is, and it's something that Annie told us earlier, is that there really are only a handful of these managed aquifer recharge schemes in the UK. Most of those that are still operational are completely different. They're, they're um, public water supply schemes that pump treated water into confined aquifers. And what we're doing here is taking effectively river water and dumping it into a shallow unconfined aquifer. And that's, I think that's unique in, in the UK. I certainly haven't heard of one being permitted in the past 15 years or so. So that uniqueness actually brings quite a few challenges, um, particularly regulatory challenges. When the legislators were drawing up the Water Resources Act and the Groundwater Directive, you can bet they didn't think about managed act for recharge. So it means that legislation is not really there. Uh, the other problem is that there's no regulatory process or framework. And there's certainly no external guidance for people like me, and, and I guess there's probably no internal guidance about how to do managed act for recharge. So that's the, the, the preamble, that's the context. Um, so what we're doing is taking the water that John's pumping up to the reservoirs, we're taking a bit off and we're infiltrating it into the shallow crag aquifer using perforated pipes. Reasonably straightforward and we're not here to talk about the technicalities of the scheme, we want to talk about the regulatory challenges. So what we have to do with the Manage Act for Recharge is make sure the water first of all goes in, we've got to infiltrate it, and that involves raising the groundwater. Now, you can't just raise the groundwater without looking at the risks of doing that. We don't want to flood people's basements. We don't want to cause drainage problems or, or, or uh, crop problems. Um, before we even put the water in, we have to make sure that the quality is OK. We can't go around introducing nasties into the aquifer. Once they're in there, it's pretty difficult to get them out. We have to prove that the water stays there and then we've got to suck it out again. And we're re-abstracting through a couple of boreholes. But when we're doing that, we have to be careful that we're not depleting any other groundwater sources nearby or depleting stream flows or wells. Now, the Environment Agency, Jonathan here, is responsible for making sure that we do all that without causing those risks. And they do that through a system of permits. And actually, part of the one of the, the main outcomes of this MAR scheme, this trial, was to demonstrate that we could produce an MAR, a working MAR system and have it regulated. So what are the permits that the Environment Agency need us to, to apply for? Well, first of all, and um, before we even get into operation, for the investigations, we have a groundwater investigation consent. Now, that's a brilliant invention. It's low risk, easy to apply for, and it lets you do the investigations, test the system, make sure it's working, or, or if it's not working, why it's not working. It also lets the agency tell you what sort of monitoring you need to do to get the permits that you need to run the system operationally. And so those permits are a discharge consent, which you need for the recharge, and that tells you how much you can recharge and when, and very sets, may set quality parameters. And then you need an abstraction license to suck the water out. And again, that tells you how much and when you can do it. So the supporting information that the agency suggested we collect was pretty onerous. Um, we took monthly samples um, over a period of over a year of the source water, looking at 590 odd compounds. Um, 
uh, for 13 samples. We also took that broad sweep sample of the source aquifer. During the test, we did testing for major ions at 20, on 20 occasions before, during and after the test. And we had real-time EC loggers in the boreholes monitoring conductivity changes. In terms of water resources, we had meters on the boreholes, we had meters on the discharge pipe. We were measuring groundwater levels at 11 locations, um, nine observation boreholes and the two recharge boreholes. We also measured stream flow to make sure we weren't having an impact on nearby rivers or streams. We measured climatic data and soil moisture in the field next to where we were recharging, just to make sure we weren't causing crop problems. Now, that was quite a big project. And in fact, I calculated the, the cost of monitoring, just the equipment and the analysis at about 63,000. That, to put it in context, with project management time is about a third of the total project costs. So onto the results. Uh, we recharged the aquifer by about 18,000 cubic meters in June last year. We took it out between July and September, and you can see here on, on the graph, um, recharge, we had an increase in groundwater levels in the boreholes themselves and, and the observation boreholes adjacent to the site. And then when we started taking the water out, we had a, whoops, oh, sorry. <laughs> When we started taking the water out, we had a substantial drop in the groundwater levels, as expected, but actually they bounced back pretty quickly as soon as we stopped abstracting. In terms of water quality, we didn't find any real nasties in the source water, thank God, because you know, we'd have had to stop the trial. Um, we were slightly concerned by elevated chloride levels. Mostly we think from road salting rather than saline ingress, and they hovered around between 100 and, and 120, although we did get peaks at about 180 milligrams per litre. And also nitrate levels were hovering around 20 to 40 milligrams per litre. But interestingly, the source aquifer was pretty dirty itself. And so what ended up happening was that we'd, we actually ended up diluting the receiving aquifer. The, the, um, so you can see just here, where you have a slight drop in chloride concentrations where we put the MAR water in. So at the end of the day, the agency processed all this data for us and um, we, we, it looks like we're going to receive these coveted permits and consent. So we're going to get a discharge consent, which allows to take to, to recharge the aqua with about 40,000 cubic metres with real-time chloride and nitrate sensors. And we're going to get an abstraction license, which allows us to take about 40,000 cubic meters out. So at the end of the day, I think we succeeded in that part of the project objective in getting a working system that the Environment Agency could permit. A couple of comments and conclusions, though. First, it was a very expensive, time-consuming and arduous process to do the permitting. And I think that would be a barrier, realistically, to other schemes, field scale schemes like this. Secondly, we couldn't have done it unless the Environment Agency see, were a project partner. If they were simply a regulator just standing on the side doing their regulatory job, it would have been very, very difficult. So we really relied on that, the benefit of their expertise and guidance. And then thirdly, bearing in mind the risk of a low quantity of water, similar chloride levels, similar nitrate levels, I think we probably should be asking, OK, if we do this again, do we need to take quite such a precautionary approach? And that's over to you, John, I think. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Well, as you know, one thing regulators hate is risk. And uh, we are the most risk adverse creatures on the planet. Um, and so this was a very interesting project for us to be working with the farmers and their consultants to try and overcome some of the natural inclinations we have. And what we were trying to do is uh, through this project was also understand and learn 
by working in partnerships. So it was very interesting, the risk perception between the farmers and ourselves. Farmers were very interested in sort of what were they having to input, what were the project finances, what were the timescales, when would they be able to have the water. We on an environmental side, that really wasn't, you know, it was an outcome, but that was less of an issue. What we're really interested in is the site specific, what are you going to be doing? Are there any sensitive features around? Our whole perception is very much focused in on what's the legislation say? What do we have to control? And are we setting a precedent for other areas? Because obviously, if this one goes ahead, which it has, um, you know, people are going to refer to this and say, well, OK, the Environment Agency regulated this one. What's, what, what, what about somewhere else? And I think one of the key things to pick out was as Paul made the point, this was a surface water abstraction going straight into the ground. So from a, every alarm bell went for me because it, there's a main road that runs down into Felixstowe, which is the largest container port in the country. That drainage goes into the water course. They were abstracting it. Hence, I was a complete swine when it came to sampling. I wanted to know that there was definitely no uh, issues with chemicals uh, of concern. And as Paul has mentioned, the great news was we didn't find any hazardous substances at all. And there were just really the chloride and the nitrate that were the, the concerns, which again, we could restrict and control on the permit. And Paul was quite happy that they would be able to meet those in their day to day side of things. So giving you a feel for the risk perception side of it, as I say, it was very interesting for us to be working closely with farmers because they were treating it as a financial project with an outcome we were treating it as a very interesting experiment. And that did cause a bit of friction, didn't it? I mean, let's be honest, that, that was one of the concerns. We were in sort of research mode and there was an awful lot of money being spent by an awful lot of farmers um, and obviously European uh, money through Fresh to Sea that was having an impact. So when is there enough information? And this was really the fundamental point. And going back to uh, the point made with, uh, earlier, we, in an ideal world, I would have had 24-7 monitoring on that uh, watercourse to know that beyond all doubt. So we had to come to a reasonable compromise between ourselves and the project as to what could be sampled for. And again, it's language. We were talking about something called an LCMS scan, which doesn't quantify everything, but just tells you whether it's there. Um, our labs, unfortunately, were not able to do the work. Um, we, luckily, we got another contractor who was very good. Um, but again, the language is a bit different. Um, so we were talking about something that maybe wasn't coming across uh, quite so well. Water resources, there were some sensitive um, water features nearby. Um, we do have to be looking at, you know, what the recovery was and so on. And again, we have to be satisfied that the water is going there, it's staying there and, and coming out. So again, we were quite hard on what Paul had to do to monitor and, and confirm what was going on under the ground. Local environment, um, you know, we didn't have a, a obviously with the, the pipeline, there was a very clear benefit from salt marsh um, restoration. This, we were much more looking at what was the potential impact on local water courses and, and things like that. Um, a lot of that was then feeding into the investment decisions that John and, and, the, and Paul and the farmers were having to make because they need certainty as far as they can get it. And we're going, mm, not so sure about that. So, you know, it, it was quite an interesting challenge that way. Um, and then obviously there's the long-term legacy um, of a project such as this, showing that, you know, things can work. Um, maybe there's been a few hiccups. It could have been better, but it does certainly show how we can do it. So. What I really wanted to just pick up was, is, these are really sort of discussion or thought process points really. So um, from a farmer's viewpoint, monitoring appeared very precautionary as, as Paul has suggested. And there was the high costs, which does impact on the commercial viability and repeatability of that. Um, from my side, how much information was enough? I had to go down the risk-based decision-making process, which was great because it's something, you know, this was the only way we could approach this was not using the legislation firmly, but using it much more on the risk base. Um, and the lessons is very much about communication. We, we, you know, we had our ups and downs, but we got there in the end. Um, standing in each other's shoes, for me as a regulator, to actually take and try and see the frustration others were having trying to get those permits. 
and then clarity from day one on what the expectations were. I think that would be a fair summary of what we learned, really, wasn't it? I'd agree. Yep, good. There we go. So, and we're still smiling at each other, so it's got to be good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Take a seat and right, um, come you. on back onto the stage, um, everybody that's uh, spoken so far. Right, and thank you to the audience for being so engaged. We've got another um, huge batch of questions to try and um, work our way through here. Um, and we've got plenty of time to do it. So um, I shall pick some here from, um, from what we've got. So a question that was asked um, this morning, actually, um, that would be interesting because it links directly into what we've just been talking about. So the EA appear to be quick to remove a licence to extract, but very slow in granting one in approved ways of storing water. What could be done to change this? So I think that's yours, Tom. Yeah, that's a nice <laughs> one, isn't it? I mean, we do currently have a, a, an issue with permitting backlog, and I think also when things are slightly novel, it can take time. Um, I think the reality is, is that we've looked at today we've seen that there is a massive deficit in water and so we are very very cautious about issuing new licenses and that takes a long time in the analysis so we're very clear what we have to claw back to try and improve the environment uh, but when it comes to issuing new licenses then that's certainly something where we are much more cautious and that's where the risk adverse side of us comes out i'm afraid i think the um the challenge and i go back to the so there are now three um, very active water groups, uh, water factor groups representing different areas of the country. Um, if we can professionalise them so that they could be afforded the insight into uh, how uh, DEFRA EA policy is going to roll out in terms of clawback, mm -hmm. like our uh, public water supply get. They work on a 25 year rolling plan with five year updates it's very clear to them within the investment decisions they have to make when those impacts and where those impacts are likely to happen. That's the kind of insight that would be really helpful to agriculture. Brilliant, thank you. There's a, um, one that's just landed actually that's come in that sort of step, step, stepped on from that. So um, what are the next steps that the EA could take to streamline the, the MAR process? Is it, is it a question of resources or are there is there learning that could be taken forward from this? There's certainly learning from this project and um, I think looking back, um, as I say, we would certainly taking a more, um, being prepared to take a bit on a bit more risk is certainly something. Um, however, I would say that there's so many site specific issues with these, these proposals. As I say, we go back to whether it's raw water, treated water, what the geology is. Um, I think there are some principles that can be streamlined and there is some, uh, hopefully going to be some work uh, from national colleagues looking at NAR opportunities across the country more. Um, but it certainly is, it's so, um, it's novel, but it's not novel and we should be at the point, and I'm hoping that the uh, EPR regulations when they come in will allow maybe some streamlining in the permitting process. So fingers crossed next year things may be a little bit more straightforward because I'm hoping you'll only need one permit. Uh, UNESCO published an interesting book about MAR last year or end of 21 with 26 examples. So it's very interesting if you want, if you want to learn. Uh -huh. And they're, they're very different. They're from drinking water to uh, farmers. So uh, it's interesting to learn from the experiences from a long time. Yeah. yeah. So and uh, just practically, um, having filled out the application forms for a discharge consent, they are all tailored towards effluent, you know, industrial or sewage effluent, and they're all tailored towards avoiding at any cost putting it into the aquifer. So actually, you know, practically, it's a bit of a, a brain twister to, to try and even complete the forms. So, you know, that would be, that would be a start. Yeah. I mean, if you think how many thousands of discharge, effluent discharges we regulate, and then there's one or two miles, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it is certainly, the process is not designed yep. for that. Yeah. And from your experience, the, the, there's a question here about, the, we've been doing it since 1810, but yeah. um, what's the barrier to, do, do you see from a sort of bigger picture, having worked right across the world on this, 
um, to, to sort of moving on from what seems like a bit of a pilot phase at the moment. From 1810, you know, we've increased two, three hundred percent since 1810. Most other things have increased thousands of percent. <laughs> exactly. Then, so why aren't we better at it and, now? And of course, the 1810 case was a riverbank filtration case, and they have mm -hmm. been more successful yeah. than the other cases. Uh, I think it's 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 really local circumstances that determine uh, the the chance of success. So it's it's a subsurface composition, it's it's water uh, mixing of water, so water quality issues, uh, and that so that's clogging. Mm. Thank you. Um, back to some smaller detail, Manuel. How do you determine the grain size of the gravel? Did you see any difference in the um, in the removal efficiency between wood chips and gravel? We haven't well, been able to investigate that. And in fact, the the grain size doesn't matter because it's it's mainly the the bacteria that do the work. So uh, it, I think it doesn't matter much. But of course, to my uh, I think the gravel we, we have chosen now was too coarse. But uh, yeah. That's the next stage. <laughs> a bit more experiment. I didn't decide that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in terms of nitrogen removal, um, that was high in August. Was that um, perhaps due to a change in the re reverse osmosis feed and hence concentrate of the water quality? Yeah, I think so. It's, it has always been higher in, uh, in the summer, also in the pilots. And we, then we have also the, the, the largest uh, concentrations and uh, the bacteria work the better when the in warmer conditions. So I think they are. Uh, it's logic that we have a better removal in some. But the the fact is that even even in winter during the pilot, we still had removal some some kind of removal because the, the water was always above f five degrees. So bacteria always stayed active in winter to a certain amount. So that's a positive thing. Even in winter, you have some removal. Thank you. Um, we've got some more Felix de Hydrocycle questions here. Um, how many years was it between the farmers investing in the scheme and water becoming available, and how did you convince them to fund it? Um, it would be less than a year from when the, the, the cash was put on the table as such. Um, obviously, it was phased in as the build kind of progressed. Um, and <laughs> yeah, a couple of meetings down the pub went a long way to get it um, <laughs> to get some traction. Um, I think also what was important, a lot of the earlier conversations, uh, I make the analogy, uh, do you want to get on a bus and go on a trip? Everybody jumps on the bus, it's great. The minute you sit at the door and say, this is the cost of the ticket to come on the bus, then some people decide it's a bit expensive. It's a bit brutal, but it was when we did that process of this is what it will cost you and this is what you'll need to loan. We actually went from 14 farms, no, sorry, 11 farms down to six. And that then gave enough commitment to, to get the bus running. Mm -hmm. And there are now more buses coming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Um, We've got one that is um, yeah, definitely revving the engine and um, one in Norfolk that is, yeah, thinking about it. So okay. That's I think it's already been um, seen as an, an example of how there are some options still there. Okay. Yeah. I think we would definitely call a halt to the analogy as well. We're okay. Yeah. No more talking about buses. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, uh, there was one last question around this that, about planning permission for, for MAR. Do you need planning permission in, in England for, um, for MAR or can it be built under permitted development? Um, it depends who's in the room. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, this went through under planning, um, uh, sorry, under permitted development um, on the basis that our groundworks were uh, land drainage, which is a permitted development. Yeah. Um, and so we didn't specifically ask the question. I think somebody sitting near to me advised me that don't ask the question you don't want the answer to. It's, Is yeah, it's, defi it's definitely Sorry. permitted. <laughs> 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 He's trying to get me in trouble. Um, the, um, it's definitely permitted development um, in terms of 
ag it's the same as agricultural drainage practice. So it's you're digging you're digging a ditch on the, on your land to um, to manage water on your land, which is permitted development. The challenge comes with with longer pipelines and and when you're crossing land ownership. Uh, and there it's a little bit more confusing about what the guidance actually says in terms of whether you need planning permission or not. But, um, yeah. but, but we took great care in what we did at Felixstowe in terms of avoiding um, the receptors that would have um, meant that we caused any damage, so archaeology, biology, um, habitats, etc. So we, 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 we took care to make sure that we were doing the right thing, although we were doing it under permitted development. Great. Um, trying to move through this so do we can we talk about the price that farmers pay is that something we can do with this group so the the, the comparison uh, again it was one that was asked um, earlier today you know what is the price that farmers are willing to pay in the UK Belgium and the Netherlands for water um, I don't know if we've got everybody here to be able to answer that I mean John you mentioned um, 20 to yeah, just over 20 pence per per cube we've had another price um, from uh, from other partners saying 30 to 50 um, cents per cube. Um, it, it feels broadly that we're, with inflation, we're around about that 40 pence um, euro cents a, a cube mark at the moment. Um, but but like anything, it's, it's what the market is mm. prepared to pay, isn't it? And um, if the reality of Daniel's red map was uh, um, as significant as that, I'm sure water would take a completely different value than as we sit today, where people are going, it might become really scarce, but we haven't quite got a head around how scarce. Yeah. Um, but then if you link that to the fact that you're talking about an investment in a 20-year scheme, it's very hard to understand the return on the investment when you don't know how much the supply is going to change the market. Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, I don't know. Uh, 40 pence at the moment, I think, would be... Or, or possibly a bit higher. I mean, uh, certainly some of the reservoir grant applications we did, people were quoting figures of, of 50 or 60 supplied to the farm. Uh, that might be a bit... Ah, sorry, yes. It, uh, for Are we talking about a transfer scheme or a... Well, it, how much farmers are willing yeah. to pay for water, I suppose, is yeah. the broad question. So, yeah, possibly more. And then there's also the, 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 the loss factor. I think it was Nils who mentioned that earlier, in that the cost to farmers of suddenly not having the water is a lot more. Mm. And I think Cranfield did some work on it, Cranfield Uni, a few years back, and yeah, the costs were quite extreme. Yeah. Mm. We did an inquiry 10 years ago, I think, to put a second network in with grey water for the farmers, but they were not, it, it would cost at least oh, about one euro, but they were not, uh, they didn't want to pay that one yeah. euro. But I think much of have changed now with, with the drought in the last couple of years. So mm -hmm. maybe, yeah, if they lack water, they have a bigger problem. So, mm. yeah. 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 Um, there's an interesting question here about, um, shouldn't regulators and the public be involved sooner rather than later? which I think we've, it, it would be interesting to reflect with, with um, partners from the continent about how you're, we've got a, um, a regulator within the, part, within the partnership here and working very collaboratively. Is that your experience in, in um, where you're from? We always involve the regulators from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it's much easier. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the regulator. <laughs> He's a, he's a nice one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Love it. I mean, we were involved from day one. I mean, right back the very first meeting that Jane Birch organised, and I think that has helped um, certainly our willingness to be involved. I think if we hadn't built that relationship, we might have been a bit more cautious. I, th I think also as we get to the dregs of the barrel, um, not talk, looking at you, <laughs> sorry, um, uh, uh, you know, there is less and less water now, and we've got to be really quite creative about how we use that, but still protect the environment, etc. Then early collaboration and understanding of all the partners, whether that's regulators or other interested stakeholders, the earlier you get to better, the more likely you'll get a positive outcome. But the problem is that much has changed over the last 10, 15 years, because everybody goes for legal issues now. So 
10, 15 years, you, you could go for a consensus with them, but now they're st stick to the to the legal uh, to the strict legal uh, um, law. So because they, they they want to avoid to have legal issues uh, afterwards, so that's a problem now. Mm. We can't make any consensus anymore. Yeah. Um, Annie, maybe this is a question for you. <coughs> what what would be the most beneficial using rainwater within a household, grey water systems, or infiltrating that rainwater in the garden? I'm looking at the question. I think it's a, it's a very difficult one. <laughs> I mean, you, you know that when you're using rainwater to flush your toilet, that it's water that's not extracted uh, from somewhere else. Yeah. So that's very beneficial, of course. Um, so I, I guess that's that's the answer, but I, I don't think there's a. I think it also depends where you are, where your water comes from. But um, it, it, it's a, it's a very good question. <laughs> there's also a price to the pump and to the efficiency of the yeah. pumps that they use in households. It's not the same that we use in our drinking water company. So mm -hmm. the carbon footprint can be somewhat higher using that. So it's it's mm -hmm. not. No. It's not. Uh, not a simple. It's simple to answer. Yeah. No. But, <laughs> I would say saving water is uh, don't not, yeah, not using it in the first place. Is the, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, but saving water by by flushing your toilet. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Grey water system just edges it. Okay. Um, That's for you, Jonathan. One for you. How much opportunity does the EA have to travel and meet with equivalent colleagues in other countries who have experienced MAR wastewater and reuse? Well, I'm here. I mean, it's a perfect answer, isn't it? I mean, yeah. obviously, this is this is an example where the EA, unfortunately, because of COVID, etc., we haven't travelled as much as we normally would. But yes, we we are able to travel. I think um, it's very much more. Um, I think a lot of the involvement is with our environment and business teams at a national level. Um, this is a local trial, and I've been feeding up through to uh, colleagues so that uh, there may well be that uh, they, they following this will, will be more active and uh, maybe get contact with people more. Yeah, certainly. I mean, this experience of running projects like this is, is critical, isn't it, to change in behaviour? And it's, yeah. it's a shame we're not going to be part of the next round of, of this. Um, and I think we need to find ways and, yeah. and argue for why we should try and become part of future international collaborations, because without... Without that learning, we don't inject new thoughts and ideas into mm. what we do, do we? So, no, it's really important. Um, what we potentially put into aqu aquifers with manure and sludge application isn't um, isn't that under monitored in relation to um, what's required under novel MAR systems. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's, a <good> <laughs> That's a good one. Um, I mean, obviously, there are farming rules for water. There is um, sewage sludge disposal regulations. Um, there are uh, regulations around when you're applying nutrients. So there's nitro vulnerable zones. So there is a lot of regulations in place. Um, when you're looking at a what I would call more a point source situation, which is what an MAR is, then um, the you know there is much clearer permitting uh, requirements. The permitting side for land spreading etc is uh, more based on exemptions and uh, showing a benefit to the activity uh, and so it is regulated but um, I wouldn't comment as to whether it's under regulated or not it's beyond beyond me I'm afraid <laughs> <laughs> thank you um, so one here for Emmanuel I think um, how do you determine the, the um, the depth of uh, extraction pipes at the Brackman case and how much space is needed between the fresh and salt border in the abstraction pipe or maybe that was Anna actually. Uh, yeah I think so. Uh, so, so, so the, um, uh, the, the depth of the extraction pipes are five meters below uh, below surface level mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the drains at the top are 60 centimeters below the surface. Um, and the rest of the question was, how, how do you de determine? I've put it into the archive now. Uh -oh. so. <laughs> <laughs> was it uh, Simon? Between fresh and salt. Between fresh and salt? Yes, and how, yeah. So how, how, we, how we measure that? Yes. So what we use is, uh, is, is well logging. So how much space is needed between the fresh and salt? Between the fresh and salt? Well, the fresh water interface, sorry? Yeah, 
Yeah. Why a five year depth? Why why not like two meter depth of uh, ten meters of depth? How do you determine where you extract the water from the fresh water bound? Oof. That's, uh, I think it shouldn't be too low because then you're, you're, you ha will have uh, salt water upconing, of course. Um, yeah, and you want to have it uh, deep enough as well. So, yeah. Do you get, I mean, uh, curious, do you get like a mixing zone? Um, you know, with, with, with you've got your fresh water sitting on top of your saline yeah. water. Yeah. Is there a, is there a, there is a, there's there a brackish is a, zone a as well? There is a brackish zone, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. And hopefully this top question here means something to you, Anna, but ha do you expect uh -huh. the 10 centimetre, four metre rule yeah. to happen at the Brackman? Yeah. Could you explain the, the, the 10 centimetre, the, four the, metre the, the answer is a, a no, I do not expect okay. it to happen. So that's the, the, the rule is in a perfect situation, you have that one in 40 rule, uh, but, but in practice, it's usually one in 15 or one in 20. So as, as, as soon as you have some resistance by clay layers and stuff, you, uh, yeah, you're, it will be usually one in 15, I think. You, even below the dunes, which are beautiful sands with mm -hmm. some clay layers, it's not one in 40. Okay. It's a beautiful theory. <laughs> <laughs> in models, it is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> models always work. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with the horizontal flow towards the existing drainage systems? Yeah, that's a good question, because, yeah, of course, if, if you are infiltrating water in a creek ridge system, um, yeah, your water also flows to the sides, and actually in this case, it's a, in the Braakman, it's a really permeable sand, so it goes really fast. Um, and actually, it's also the, the more water you add, the higher your gradient, so the faster it will actually flow towards your surface uh, surface system. So there's a, there's a sweet spot there, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I mean, interestingly, with, with ours, we had a very low hydraulic conductivity aquifer, so, yeah. so the water stayed so, there, yeah. but then it was very difficult to suck it out, yeah. so uh, yeah. Yeah, gains and, and losses. Yeah, exactly. Do you know why it was so difficult to, to get out? At water um, uh, because the, the, the hydraulic conductivity in the aquifer was, was low, so water couldn't travel through it fast enough to get into that small suction pipe. Um, whereas if it had been a very fast, loosely packed aquifer, the water would easily drain into it. Mm -hmm. um, but then the benefit, you know, as I, I said earlier, is that the water stayed there. Exactly. Yeah. So, swings and roundabouts. Yeah, you can't yeah. have everything. You should have asked for, for another well. <laughs> <laughs> Can we have another well, please? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think that's, we're going to have to draw that to a close now to um, just have a... Um, a very short break. Um, we'll be back uh, at three o'clock, four o'clock um, uh, uh, continent time. Um, and just to do then our final um, presentation um, and our final roundtable discussion before we end the conference. So um, hopefully you can have a nice break now, a cup of coffee, and um, we'll see you in 20 minutes. Thank you. Bye. Welcome back, everybody. Um, thanks for sticking with us. Um, I've just had a look at the, um, the stats on the Slido, and we've had, we've, we've had over 100 people engaging with us on, the, on Slido. So um, there's a lot of people interested in this. We've had um, some comments back that have been very positive about the, uh, the information that we've given so far. So thank you um, to everybody who's participated in the audience and, um, and as speakers so far. It's brilliant. Um, so this is the final... Um, talk today. Um, it's um, from Agith from HZ University. Um, she can't be here today, so she's recorded something earlier. So we'll, we'll um, watch that and then we'll have a roundtable discussion afterwards. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Agith van Moldegem. I'm a researcher at the HZ University of Applied Sciences and um, our team was involved in the Fresh for Seas project focusing on stakeholder interaction and how that defines collaboration and new business models for managing alternative freshwater sources. Now, unfortunately, I was not able to attend the final conference live in Ipswich. So that's why I thought it would be a good idea to share our first learnings in a video. And hopefully you can use this video as a conversation starter 
sparking further discussions and leading to deeper insights on what I see as a highly complex topic of freshwater management. Now, freshwater management is complex for a number of reasons, um, but also because of the many stakeholders that are involved in, in it. So we focused our research on five different aspects uh, by means of which stakeholders work together. So we looked at a purpose. Why do stakeholders work together and what's their mutual goal? We looked at networks, how actors use that to build on um, findings. Third, we looked at how actors organize themselves, the processes, structures and cultures. Fourth, we studied ownership or how parties established a sense of proactiveness amongst all. And last, we looked at finance or how alternative systems can become economically viable. Now, to prevent that this becomes a very lengthy uh, video, I limit myself to a number of key observations, but the full roadmap will elaborate on some other topics as well. Now, let's start with purpose. We found out that motivations of parties to innovate are not the same. They range from farmers seeking better yields, income protection, to industry partners looking to become less dependent on a single water source, to nature conservation, safeguarding biodiversity. What becomes clear is that most parties are driven by a wish to solve an immediate problem, with maybe some of the larger parties also seeing opportunity to combine this with sustainability goals. Also, our findings make clear that not all small parties feel the need or are in a good position to participate and to innovate. Some already did some investments in the past, or they lack infrastructure today that make them interesting parties to involve. Others do not expect water to become a problem in the near future, maybe due to their long-term abstraction licenses, or because they are in an area where fresh water is not perceived to be a problem. So let's turn to the networks involved. As said in the beginning, freshwater management involves a lot of parties and there are many interdependencies. Now, looking at the regions, it becomes clear that there are um, big variations between the systems and between the regions. Now, while the use of water on the right hand side of this picture runs across similar lines, the light blue color in this picture depicts where the differences are. And, um, most of these concern the role of the public bodies. Um, the different parties responsible for policy making, regulatory frameworks, uh, safeguarding quality. And overall, this results in, in a fragmented field of policies and governance, and that complicates to make a connection when facing cross-border issues. Still looking at networks, we know from theory that effective development and implementation of innovative solutions require involvement of parties that are carefully selected and that are representative for all those who have a stake, either in the short or the long run. Now, for most partners, this requires them to go beyond, to seek new relationships that go beyond their current relationships find new coalitions. And we learned that this is not an easy thing to do. Um, we took considerable efforts, we put considerable efforts in finding uh, partners with an interest to participate in the DAO project, for example. Also, it was difficult to get the right governmental bodies at the table at the right time, often because they were too busy or they could not see a clear role for themselves. So overall, our projects included especially those with a clear, direct, often economic interest, or those already forming part of the current relationships of the project partners. Parties whose interest was less obvious, at least for the short run, uh, think of tourism or nature parties, were not always involved. 
Now, we looked at various topics in the sphere of governance. For example, we looked at learning and innovation goals and how this defines collaboration. But for now, I'd like to focus on how dynamic systems that need a change require not only involvement of a representative set of selected actors, but also an early involvement of those actors. Only by means of such an early involvement, actors can develop a shared vision and use that to drive action. Now, ideally, such a shared vision includes a complete view on how the new system will bring value and how it can become beneficial for all. And this is in short where integrated value is about, and that requires a long-term view. Now, our findings in the Fresh for Seas project show that the timing of involvement of the full ecosystem is generally late. Vision on goals and objectives of the pilot projects were developed at the pre-project proposal phase, and therefore largely based on value needs of the project partners. So a full exploration of the values of all system actors was impossible to achieve at this stage. And as a consequence, the project was not guided by a complete holistic view on integrated, on the integrated value of water. And instead, the project tried to combine or coordinate the values of the parties, parties who were present at the uh, project proposal phase. Now, ownership is a very important aspect determining a project's success. In major transitions, having a single strong leading party is not enough. And project partners need to establish a sense of proactiveness and ownership with all the parties. So this requires parties being clear on their roles and being able to establish trust amongst the others. And various scholars point out that the complex system change that we need today requires a different role of the government. We need governments that do not only try to fix market failures, but, do, act, but actors, governments that intervene actively in the system in order to prevent a system and transformation failures. Now we learn from the Fresh for Seas project that governments are not yet playing such new roles and that they struggle with their role. They have difficulty to see themselves as part of the system and as a party that can create together with all the others an entire new system. Examples of these struggles were found in um, original focus of governmental bo uh, bodies, either on flawed or on prevention, either on quality or on quantity. And the parties, the governmental bodies, questioned whether they should take a broader role and go beyond those traditional assignments in regulating and protecting. Now, this struggle led other parties to more or less passively wait for the action, wait for the governments to, to join. And this affected ownership and proactiveness. There are some other findings on uh, ownership as well. For example, how small parties expect larger parties to take the lead and to establish trust and open agendas. Also, we noticed how vertical linkages, so a well representation within each organization um, is very important to ensure that the organizations that they represent are committed to the results and the findings. And we observed many times that key persons within one organization were contradicting themselves or did not agree on um, long-term views or project status or um, next steps. Now, the final aspect is finance. And we already touched upon the importance to start projects from a shared view on integrated value. Now, 
creating this this view is not an easy thing to do and science is constantly looking for new frameworks that can help to define and measure all values so not only economical ones but also social and ecological values and available frameworks such as this one of common land take a long-term view and um, aim to to come up with a metric that captures all those values and that is accepted by all because it can then become an, a powerful tool to as a to base um, financial interventions on so that can help to redistribute value um, to those who do have cost but cannot directly benefit from the innovation. Now, our observations within the Fresh for Seas project learn that a common metric for integrated value is more than needed, but we're still a way to go. We are in a situation that current innovations are not available to all uh, because um, they are dependent on location and previous investments of the actors. And as a, as a consequence, we have to deal with a mismatch between those who pay and those who gain. Now, for those who are in a position to innovate, investments in alternative freshwater systems require considerable investments for which the returns, both financial and non-financial, only become available on the long term. Now, despite of this, the mindset is especially on short-term financial value leaving undiscussed the societal and ecological gains and having a, a strong focus on cost and payback time. Now, at the basis of these calculations uh, are, are highly specific, stakeholder-specific estimations of the future price of water. And these estimations vary with current prices paid, risk perceptions, um, cash flow positions and um, added to this is that the, the, the perceptions of the current price of water are not accurate because they do not fully incorporate all costs. So it's easy to see how all this leads to diverse and irreally, irrealistic perceptions of acceptable prices and that this is far beyond the shared view on the value of water. Now, let me summarize all this in a number of key lessons we take from our experiences. First, we suggest to embed in future project, projects both a strong strategic involvement from all parties from the earliest phase of the project on, as well as a carefully planned social innovation process with sufficient time to select and engage uh, representatives of all stakeholders. We suggest to consider a mission-driven approach uh, in which all parties collaborate for longer time than just a single project and that explicitly targets technological, institutional and bottom-up social innovation. We advocate an approach that allows us to allocate sufficient time to establish a shared vision and to define long-term goals and thus allocate more time for definition and alignment in a pre-project phase and a commitment for a series of related projects. Now this means that we probably need to have a different organization than we currently have for subsidized projects. Now as part of a long-term view, it's important to agree on a common metric for measuring all costs and all returns and development of a common framework and metric and the use of this for assessing all stakeholder specific impacts and dependencies may become a, a first strategically important project of which the outcomes may be used for development of a program of follow-up projects. At the same time, it's important to take some time to consider the geographical scope of our projects with possibly more intention for cross-border projects, 
considering the cross-border issues we came across. And then ultimately, at a project level, we should make sure that lead parties have a clear view on their roles and on the instruments and competences with which they can create trust and ownership. As said, there's more to come in the roadmap. For now, I wish you uh, fruitful discussions in uh, the next program item. I think we should give her a round of applause. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's fascinating to hear how people are reacting to what we're doing and, and um, what their views are about um, how we should do it differently as we, as we move forward. So, um, and with that in mind, I'd like to invite um, Bastian, Emma, Steph, John and Marik Mariska to, um, to the stage to, um, to continue that discussion. So there's, we've got some questions that we're, we're going to discuss and to talk about, but feel free to, to um, continue to access Slido. I'll have the tablet on my lap, and if you've, if you've got a question you want to be involved, then tap it in and, and, and add it to the, um, to the system. Um, but I thought I'd start off by asking, um, is the solution to sustainable water management a technical one or something more around behaviour change? I think uh, it goes hand in hand, to be honest, because when you uh, discuss these types of new technologies and new possibilities with farmers, um, um, you always um, have to look at what's possible in the region and then you can get an idea of how can you collaborate around that. So I don't really think you can divide uh, those things. So um, they go hand in hand and um, make the other possible. Mm -hmm. Which one have we got to work harder on, do you think? Well, if this was any business, it, that's a supply and demand question to me. And until you change the behaviour, you don't change the demand. And once you've got a clear demand, you have a technical challenge to supply the supply. So I would lean towards um, getting people to understand the change that they've got to do. Otherwise, you could end up getting a long technical solution. So it's, it's possibly more of a communication To start with, to yeah. Start with. But, mm. yeah. Awareness, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it also very <laughs> much sorry, everybody wants to <laughs> also very much links into uh, the early actor involvement that we've seen in some of the projects as well um, and sometimes it takes a little bit of time to understand each other uh, and from there build towards a solution um, so i think that's a very important thing that we've seen in the fresh for seas pilots mm -hmm. our our experience usually in in the research that we do um, as a water technology group is that it's often not the technology that's the problem. So the technology can do the job, uh, but the limitations come more uh, when people get involved, when legislation gets involved, and uh, the technology works, but how do we roll it out and how do we get people to use it are the biggest challenges that we see. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's the secret to success? Where, um, how, how is that most effectively done, where you bring the technology and the people together? Are there, has anybody got any sort of strong learning from trust it starts with stress yeah yeah i think it's it's yeah. all about yeah it's involving <laughs> yeah involving everybody yeah. or as many actors as possible at an earlier stage as possible and be very honest yeah. about what you're trying to achieve that's i think uh, that's what we learned in yeah and i find and, and i don't want this specifically about farmers but um it's when they really see the the risk then their check behavior changes so if you can take them to the edge and go that's what it looks like, then you suddenly get great feedback and, and you know what you've got to do. Mm -hmm. Until they see that, uh, I struggle to get the, the feeling that anything's going to change. Yeah. I think a really good example of that, sorry, is, is what we saw with, uh, with Paul and Jonathan's discussion. There were two people who, who worked together over the years and maybe mm -hmm. didn't always see eye to eye and yeah. had different perspectives, but could still try and, and solve the problem together because it was a joint problem to, to solve. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a good ex example that we can take away from the project. Excellent. Fascinating. Uh, much has been said, but I think uh, 
it's important uh, that you have good communication, that you are also aware of each other's objectives, mm -hmm. why you want to do something, yeah. and that you don't lose objective out of your eye, uh, that you keep focused on the objective. Yeah. So is drought something that, with it becoming more common, is that something that we should sort of embrace and expect and not see so much as it is, it's an obvious physical problem, but should we see it as an opportunity to drive that change and to, to, to raise awareness to, to enable action? Should we be thinking when the next drought comes, we need communications out there to engage with people that we haven't engaged with before to, to, to highlight the, the, the solutions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping for more. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think awareness raising is, is very important uh, mm. in drought and in general in the society to make people aware about the change we need uh, to react to the drought. It's very important and we should never forget also that drought goes together with flooding mm -hmm. and, and with water quality. The three things are very connected and the awareness raising about the system and how things are connected is very important to make a change. And the transition towards a society which is more resilient to climatic shocks, if it's drought or flooding, yeah. uh, really asks for a, for, for a social transition more than technological transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. We're, we're in Suffolk, we're running a, a project called Reclaim the Rain, which is all about bringing drought and flooding closer together. Um, and it, it, it's looking at the value of water. And it, that was mentioned in the last, last speech about how we do that. Because um, often we talk about wastewater and um, uh, in, for, in terms of flood water and, and effluent, um, but actually it's water is the most important thing. So, so how, how should we value, how do we um, raise the value of water and get people to stop calling it wastewater and start thinking about it as a, as a really valuable resource? Can I just, on the drought question before mm -hmm. we go to that one, yep. just thinking about it, if you look at the challenge uh, drought, everybody goes, oh, it was a dry year in 2018. It's kind of an annual reaction. If you listen to what the challenge is facing East Anglia now, it's probably not going to be a, a dry year in 2028, or we all talk about it. It's, it's the regulatory change that is going to cause a lot more challenge than a dry year. And so I think it's, it's getting clarity about how that reg regulatory change is going to impact it's more the clawback than what Mother, Ta Mother Nature is going to take away, which is the thing that's come to me over this conference. Is that's the absolute priority, understanding regulatory change, not how we react to drought necessarily. So that's coming quicker than the climate change, basically. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. No. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's fine. So I've forgotten the other question. Now. <laughs> so have I. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's valuing water. How can we more effectively value mm. water, I suppose? Is, um... It's just about wastewater. Don't call it waste. Yeah. It's about water. Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You put the price up, you value water, don't you? <laughs> I mean, that's generally what happens in life. Yep. Is if it becomes more expensive, people are more careful with it. It's, yeah, and, and I'm, I mean, I don't know the answer to this, but the. There's agricultural use of water, there's public water supply, there's, there's um, you know, ecological value of water. But I don't think that there isn't a single value for water, it's depending on what it's used for. Mm. Yeah, and um, I think we see also throughout the year as well, depending on when it's dry or when, it's, uh, yeah. when there's lots of it, uh, the value changes. Yes, and, and it is very cheap still. Can, you know, it's not cheap. To it's not truly priced, eh? yeah. like a geet or something. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the market price is still relatively yeah. cheap for what it does for us. Especially in the Netherlands, because, you know, it was a reward as a drinking company to have a low price. They were really managing that. I was so proud of that. And now these guys need to change. <laughs> so it's very difficult. Eh? They're yeah. so used to providing it very cheap. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so I suppose... What's next for your organisations? So if you, um, if you had funding to, um, to continue this sort of work um, and we had another three, four, five years to do, what, what would be the, the next challenge that you would like to, um, like to take on? There's probably several. 
I already know ours. It's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's already Good. in the pipeline. Good. Uh, what, one of the, the key lessons that we learned, uh, we were leading the, the monitoring for a lot of the cases. One of the biggest limitations was the water quality. So I think several of the presenters mentioned, okay, you find the source, the quantity is correct, but the quality is just not right. Mm -hmm. uh, so then that's a barrier to, uh, for example, infiltration uh, in the subsurface because it needs some form of pretreatment. So our subsequent research will then be um, what kind of pretreatment and looking specifically at a nature-based solution. So can we take that water and treat it, for example, in a constructed wetland to remove the undesirables out of it to make it then suitable for the next step. Mm -hmm. So we've now moved from, okay, finding the water and what where we can store it to, okay, how can we treat it to make sure that we can do that. Okay. You were too fast because we're together in the project. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, uh, yeah, I think as an organization, we, we work on different points. Water quality is certainly an important point for the future where we try together with HZ and other partners, which are some of them are present here, find, uh, find a, a green way for water treatment. So the nature-based solution, I think that's a, a very important way forward. If we look at quantity, the combination of the problems related to drought and flooding, again, together, like I just said, yeah. don't see them as separate problems, also very important. And also there, I think, uh, moving away from gray infrastructure towards a green infrastructure, which can provide several services to people, not only water provision, but other ecosystem services is certainly something uh, we will focus on in the future. So just explore that grey to green a bit more, just sort of expand on that, what do you well, mean by that? It, instead of just building something grey and in concrete infrastructure, uh -huh. uh, you, you try to build something with nature, right. which has added benefits. So what right. we call ecosystem services, yeah, yeah. for instance, the, the willows, that, that Emmanuel uh, has, they provide, uh, um, they, they provide the, 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 the wood chips, but they also cool the air in the surroundings. So if you would build a, such a marsh land in the city, they would also make our cities more livable when yeah. the summers are very hot in the, in the future. So it's really combining the different functions mm. uh, and, and nature-based infrastructure. Yeah. And most importantly, it's somewhere for Emmanuel to sit in his retirement. So. <laughs> in, in a willow chair, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. um, anybody else about wh where you, you want to go next and what you're... I'm sure Lamb Weston have got a, 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 an amazing five-year plan of all the innovation you're going to do going forward. But uh, if you, what's, the, what's the next big thing, do you think, that... You're going to be looking at for this part in of this the water area, huh? yeah. in this area. Um, now we, like I said, we are currently we have the uh, yeah, what's I think I did not really explain in my presentation was that we have variation huh, in the levels, so they are okay, but very, it's, fa it's yeah, variable, and also uh, the needs of the farmer. Huh? So optimizing also if we could get a natural fertilizer. Uh, added at the right time because they don't need it always. Uh, it's depending on the growing period. So to optimize that, that's something we need to investigate further. So yeah. So you're you're using the water as fertilizer effect. Not yet, right? but that's the idea. That's yeah, the because idea, that's yeah. their needs, and that's yeah. we just thought about water, but yeah, there's more to it. Um, and is that yeah. effect, would that effectively be some sort of closed loop in terms of would you? Would you then not need an, um, the outside fertilizer to, to be brought in? Now that's something to huh, to look into, but that yeah. would be the ideal idea, yeah, to make it really a circular uh, yeah, yeah. agricultural loop, because everything we don't have chemicals in our plants, so everything is is from is from the potatoes, yeah. from the lands, and we use water, but mm -hmm. it's yeah, same purpose. So, yeah, and, and maybe also a very interesting because we have this plant in Wisbeach. Mm -hmm. We also need to do things there to really see if we can uh, yeah, learn from the Kreininger case, see if we can do it also here, especially since you're all so busy with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and we know you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trust a little yeah, bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see as well. Uh, there's also a learning from this project. That would be fantastic, yeah. wouldn't it, yeah. to, to bring some yeah. of that learning over to, yeah. to the UK. Excellent. John, is there anything? Yeah, I, I think three, uh, an immediate thing is we've had a very successful, almost surprisingly successful MAR trial 
but it's not quite commercial. And I think it would be really nice if we can find a way of having got that result, retain it so that we can continue to demonstrate it. Um, and then just spread the word. Um, you know, the, the, the MAR, uh, the pipeline system is straightforward and quite repeatable. And so let's do some more. And then I think the strategic one is professionalize the way agriculture represents itself in the regulatory debate. And then hopefully we can get some better insights into how all this pain is going to roll out and then um, we can be better prepared. Yeah. Yeah. I think bringing that, the level of detailed information that we have of how agriculture uses its water and how it's planning for water going forward to, to become more equivalent to public water supply is absolutely critical, isn't it? It's a difficult yeah. one. Um, I've spoken to several people. But I don't think our behaviour's earned it yet. I think no. we've got to get, yeah, yeah, yeah. get to that level to... But you, you also shouldn't be expected to do that as agriculture on your own. It should be a collaborative... Yeah. Um, you know, the support should come from Water Resources East, from the water companies, from, you know, people like us to, um, to be able to support yeah. agriculture to do that. So, true. I just want to come comment on that. Uh, I think as an organization, we really like the idea of, of MAR, uh, whether it's critical filtration or maybe, maybe deeper MAR, but we see there are still many barriers and not only in the UK, but even more, at, I think in, in Belgium and maybe in the Netherlands, I don't, I'm not sure, maybe less in the Netherlands. And it's really a pity that these barriers are there, are there because MAR is a very useful way to store water and we now today everybody knows we have to store water and we don't lose land when we do LMR because mm. it's un underground and then we see these barriers and I think a lot of the barriers are related to to the regulations but the regulations are there for, are there for water quality uh, and I think many of the regulations are also justified and as a society we should really wonder if it's not necessary to stop pollution at the sources instead of trying to solve it yeah. at the end of pipe. <laughs> yeah. And we always say for many other teams, uh, the polluter pays, but apparently for water, we don't say it very often. Right. So that's something we, we should really question mm -hmm. uh, what to do with that. And, yeah. yeah, no, I think it's a very, it's a really good point. I mean, the, in the Felixstowe situation, the, one of the problems is the, is the salt. And we know where the salt comes from. It comes from putting it on the road to stop, obviously to stop the uh, cars coming off the road, um, which is, um, you know, critical. But there's going to be a solution there that we could, that would make that water much more usable if the, mm -hmm. if the MAL was, was a commercial operator. And so but it would be very difficult. My um, expectation is that it would be very difficult to bring the organisation responsible for spreading the salt to the table to say you've got to stop doing that and find a more probably a more expensive solution because we need the water, and it's it's though it's so that's a sort of a, an example of the challenge that we're facing is sort of bringing these people that are, that are stakeholders in the water but don't really realise it and need to change their behaviour in order for us to make better use of this really valuable resource. I think it's not only about paying or punishing or something, but also often by by, by education, by mm -hmm. educating, for instance, if you look at the case in, in Braak Monzet, one of the substances of concern is there, of course, uh, uh, pesticides. Maybe we can educate farmers and, and explain them how they can avoid that so many pesticides will in the end end up uh, uh, at the Evitas basins uh, and explain what they can do about it. And maybe that's a very important first step. And then it's again about communication involving everybody, the entire value chain as early as possible to, to explain what we want and why we want it and what the consequences are of some things we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have we got any other points that we'd like to raise? We've got about five minutes left to, uh, is there anything that we haven't talked about, an expansion on um, anything that you've said in your, in your talks that you didn't have time to? Um, I think regarding the barriers to implementation, Steph uh, in his research was, uh, mm -hmm. was, was looking at different barriers. We were looking at the technical side. Mm -hmm. 
And I think uh, what we have learned, especially in our relationships with the, the regulatory bodies in the different countries, so obviously the Environment Agency was an actual partner in the project, yeah. and that was fantastic yeah, yeah. because they were so involved. But in the other countries, that was not the case. Mm -hmm. They were involved as observers, and we tried to involve them from the start, but it didn't um, go as naturally as it did uh, uh, here in the UK, so that was unfortunate. And I think what we've all learned is... Um, Paul had it on a slide, the cost of the monitoring required before you can even get a permit to try and, yeah. and try one of these technologies. Yeah. So we've, we've shown that it could be an innovative solution, but if uh, ordinary Joe Bloggs or a farmer wants to do it on his own land, he cannot afford to pay those prices. And we were able to do that in the project thanks to the, mm -hmm. the funding that we got from Interreg. Yep. But we really see that uh, those monitoring long lists that the regulatory bodies are saying and, and Jonathan was saying about being risk averse, I think we need together to find a way that, that helps both parties to avoid risk but also to make it achievable to actually roll it out. Otherwise we've tested it and we can't really move any further. Yeah, yeah, there's a critical point there somewhere, isn't there? I think that, I think you're spot on. The interesting thing for me is... Um, the price of water is actually linked to um, whether you can afford to pay those kind of bills. So, um, for example, we've built the pipeline for less than a million. Uh, a company who regularly does public water supply quoted 13 million for the same quote and w was horrified when I suggested somebody had wanted a million. Um, public water supply can pay those kind of figures. Agriculture can't public water supply can pay those kind of water test figures because they have the means to, but agriculture can't, it becomes a barrier. Unfortunately, it's one market though, you know, it's one water supply, it's one water problem, but there's two different kind of currencies almost running in the same debate. And much so, I think it's great that WRE are trying to bring that together into one <coughs> um, common uh, resource corporation the money is still makes those two completely different um, considerations. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Well, should we draw it to a close? I can still uh, give you. <laughs> no, go for it. Okay. Oh, of course you can. I think a uh, thing I've really valued in this project is the cooperation between the Flemish, the, the people from Zeeland, and the people from Suffolk. We learned a lot from each other, how we do things differently and why we do things differently and why maybe we should not do things differently or maybe why we should keep doing things differently. <laughs> but some things are good, some yeah. things are less good. Um, we also, I think, appreciate it a lot that each region yeah, needs, it, needs its own trajectory and its own solutions. I am very happy that the, the cooperation with the people from Zeeland will continue in several other projects mm -hmm. and I really hope that with the UK in the future we can also find a way to cooperate because we have the same kind of problems, the same kind of region and probably the same kind of solutions. So uh, let's hope we find a way to stay cooperating mm. with the people from the UK. Definitely. Well, we know where you live now, so... Yes, <laughs> we know where we live. <laughs> We'll, um, we'll it's good to see how always that when you do a project like this that uh, cooperation goes well and that at the end of the project it's not an end, especially for the people from Zeeland and Flanders. Uh, the, the consortium has shifted a little bit, new partners and so on, mm -hmm. but that we still have follow-up projects. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good wrap-up and you've actually stolen a lot of the lines <laughs> that I was going to use in my wrap-up, so <laughs> I'll get you back for that. Um, <laughs> Um, it's time for thank yous. Um, um, we're coming to the end of the conference. I'd like to um, specifically thank um, speakers, Daniel, who I, I know now has left, but Anna as well, who um, have um, come here voluntarily. Um, everybody else had to come here, otherwise they wouldn't get paid. Um, so um, we really appreciate you taking the time um, to, to come across the ocean to... Um, <laughs> to come and visit us um, and for Daniel to come up from London. So um, that was uh, fantastic. We've had um, over 100 people, as I said, um, interacting on Slido um, during the day. So that's, um, it's great that we've um, touched that, that many people and been able to share 
um, what we've learned. Um, the presentations, the recording um, will all be shared. So um, we have your email addresses. We know where you live too. Um, so we will be um, sharing that and hopefully you can um, delve into some of that information. There was a lot of information shared today. So um, hopefully you will be able to um, uh, uh, use that. Um, there'll also be feedback forms. So we'd be really grateful if, um, if you could uh, uh, reply to those they'll drop into your e inbox in the next day or so as well um, so that would be really useful for us to understand um, how successful we've been in sharing the information um, that we have done today um, but um, before I go I did want to um, to thank some very critical people that have been um, a part of the project and today um, with um, with something um, that I've prepared so uh, first of all, um, today has um, not happened by accident. This a day um, like this um, needs an awful lot of organisation. And um, first of all, locally, that's been Chloe. She's done a huge amount of work um, um, in putting today together and organising everything. So um, thank you very much, Chloe. Um, but I think... The, the key um, organisation um, that has held all this together that hasn't really featured that much here today is our lead partner, Vito, who um, have done uh, huge amounts um, in terms of making the project the success that it is. Um, I know from the um, um, going with, I think John, with, with the first meeting, who John's never been part of a European project before, um, and we went together to the first meeting and we met, um, we met the, the team, we met Bastian and after that meeting I think we came away and, and I said um, I've been involved in a few um, and it's obvious that the, these guys know exactly what they're doing, um, they're very well organised, Bastian was, was clearly um, um, had a very clear understanding of what we needed to do, how we're going to need to do it. We've been, I wouldn't say bossed around, but um, <laughs> we've, um, we've been given very clear instructions about what we need to do and when, shall we say. So, and, and that's European projects, as many of you know, were very complicated beasts to, to manage well, and that's been done extremely well. Um, but Bastian does, is, doesn't do it all. Um, Mike and Stephanie, you have been fantastic all the way through the, the three years of the project and, and um, been a great help organising today as well. So um, we really appreciate your effort and um, I've got a little something for you too. Um, and then, of course, there's Bastian. I've mentioned him already. Um, he's been our leader. Um, he's taken us through um, three years. And um, good. I'm glad John remembered. Um, we've, um, <laughs> uh, we, we've obviously been um, thinking about what we could get for Bastian. And obviously, with this project, one of the, you know we're in the driest region in the UK, so one of the most important resources we have is water. So we've got you some water. <laughs> and John, John originally showed me that what he'd got, and I said, "No, John, Joe, you need to go and treat that water, um, with, in, and turn it into something special." So I didn't realise he was going to have to go quite so far. So I'll keep going. <laughs> so we've got some specially treated Suffolk water for you, Bastian. That, that's just the start. I think the rest of the back of John's car is full of it. <laughs> yeah. So um, I hope you've um, got strong suspension on your car on the way home. Um, but we, um, yeah, we really appreciate your help. You've done a fantastic job and thank you very much. Um, that's the end of the conference. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, uh, there's, well, it's not quite the end because there is some more drinks um, and some time to network and chat before we, uh, before we have to leave at about half past four or five o'clock. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you.